You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome to a new episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm sitting here with a, I suppose, a different Jimmy, a different Jim. It's Jim LePage from Hi, the Spike Peters. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. So Jim uh, is part of a YouTube channel called The Spike Feeders. Uh, you are known for sort of a more competitive leaning channel. In some circles, yeah. <laughs> in some circles. In the competitive circles, maybe not as much. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, competitive players love saying things aren't competitive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. Jim is also one of my fellow members on the Commander Advisory Group, so he does help advise the Rules Committee about the rules for the format. Mm -hmm. Jim, thanks for joining us. We have a very exciting topic today. You know, there's a Commander scenario that I think most players are familiar with. The game's kind of moving along, everything seems to be fine, your life total's fairly high, nothing looks super scary out there, and then boom, one player just out of nowhere puts together a series of cards and they're like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and that's going to untap this and then I'll do that this whole thing again and you see what's happening here? I'm just going to do that five million times and you're all dead. Yeah, and you're just sitting there you're like, anybody get the license plate number? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to talk about uh, combos and, and we have Jim here because CDH players are sort of known as being experts on combos. You talk about it a lot on your content and whether you're a combo player or you're the one trying to stop the combo player on this episode, we're going to break down sort of the ins and outs, how combos work, how to build them or how to identify them and then how to prepare for them, how to stop them, or maybe how to sneak them in for the win. If you, you want to be doing the combo yourself uh we're basically everything around combos we're going to discuss on this episode um but first we got to talk about our sponsors mm -hmm. channelfireball.com slash command that's the place to go if you want to order any magic product singles anything at all you know they have a new marketplace. I don't know if you've checked it out yet, Jim. I have. They yeah. have a ton of vendors on there. They vet all their vendors. They make sure that they are licensed businesses. It means there's a ton of LGSs that you're supporting when you use the Channel Fireball Marketplace. It means the inventory is very high. The prices are very competitive. I've used it a bunch now. Um, and th it's been very fast. I've gotten a very good experience. The cards have come in great condition. I really can't recommend it high enough. Channelfireball.com slash command. And the great thing is if you forget to put in the affiliate link, they have this cool feature where you get all the way to the checkout and you can just input the code command in the lower right corner there if you're like, oh, I didn't use the affiliate link. So even at the end, if you've forgotten, you do not have to like cancel your cart and redo it again. Because I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you like at carefully add all the cards to your cart and you get to the end and you're like, oh crap, I didn't use an affiliate link. That's a feel bad. So uh -huh. you can get around that by just putting in the code. Uh, also, once you get the cards, you want to keep them in really good condition. Ultra Pro is a sponsor of this show. They create the products that Jimmy uh, Wong and I, maybe Jim, I don't know for sure, uh, use to, to uh, protect all of our game pieces. We've got the nice Ultra mm. Pro playmats in front mm -hmm. of us. We've got the Kai one. I've got yeah, Chandra it. Dressed to Kill, which is a cool name of a card and also cool artwork. Mm -hmm. They also make Eclipse Sleeves, Satin Tower deck boxes. They have cool Mythic uh, mythic Collection stuff, which is like embroidered, fancy, really classy material. And they have that for deck boxes and binders and all kinds of other things. Ultra Pro really does make the best stuff to protect all of your game pieces. Uh, and the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash commands. You get all kinds of perks, can hang out on our Discord, chat with Jimmy and I each and every day. You also get to watch Game Nights and Extra Turns a day earlier than everybody else and ad-free. And we also shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to... Zach, Zach Marcus. Marcus. Zach. You rock. You stole my line, but I like it. <laughs> Good job. I was like, does he know the line? He knew the line. I've, I've watched the show yeah. once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go to the main topic here. Um, okay. It's combo talk, combo conversations, anatomy of a combo. We had a lot of possible titles. We went with combo combos. Um, okay, listen, I want to get something out of the way really quick. We know a lot of players don't like combos, but they are a thing in Commander that you can do. And basically every format of Magic has combos, right? There, yeah. isn't, there isn't any that doesn't. Maybe every once in a while a limited format doesn't, but most of them do. Uh, so there's something you should expect that you are going to at least occasionally see around the table, no matter how it is that you like to play. Mm -hmm. um, even at the most casual of tables, 
occasionally people will just sort of accidentally assemble a combo. Like this happens, right? If you have enough synergy in your deck, a combo is almost inevitable. Yeah, well, and especially with how often people steal permanents or copy permanents and stuff like that, you might find that you didn't even build a combo into your deck, but you still end up getting to play it because you stole something from somebody else, right? Very good point. Yeah. So... First of all, be sure to have the rule zero power level discussion with your pot or your play group before you begin the game so you can set expectations about the type of game you want to play. If you don't want combos involved, then that's a discussion you want to have with your with your play group. Um, and then secondly, you know, don't yell at us because we're talking about combos on this episode. I, every time we mention an infinite combo in like a set review, like, hey, Grawl knocks out and you should watch out for, well, this is not infinite, but like Hermit Druid into Thassa's Oracle, people get mad like, oh, you're telling people about CADH and it's like... Mm. This is a thing. They're on the internet watching content. They are going to mm -hmm. find combos like this. Like that is not hard information to find. It's not an intellectual contagion that we're trying to like keep under wraps here. You you can choose to play however you want to play. So so save your angry comments. Is like the 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 moral of that story. Okay. They're not going to save their ang angry comments, Jim. Spoiler oh, alert. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Anatomy of a combo. So this is the first step that we're going to talk about, and this is. Um, we're going to just sort of go through how combos work. And this, I think, will be helpful to identify them, to build them, and just kind of getting a baseline for, like, what a combo is and mm -hmm. essentially what makes it tick. So you had a really cool line in the outline uh, when we were discussing it, Jim, before the show. And I'll let you read it right here. Yeah. All actions are transactions. Now, this is... It, it maybe sounds a little esoteric, and it, it does. It sounds cool. That, it's like copy. Right? It's yeah. Like, yeah, it's a good ad copy. All right. actions are transactions. They are transactions. And really what a transaction is means you're giving something, you're getting something in return, right? Right. Yep. So that, you that pay is a cost, a and you get an effect. Yeah, you think you go to the corner store, you give them a dollar, you get a chocolate bar, right? right? As a transaction, right? Because yep. it's two-way. Yeah. And I think people can see that when they see the magic cards, like rampant growth. Mm -hmm. You pay one in a green. What do you get for it? Oh, you get a land into play tapped. Like mm -hmm. there's a cost and I get an effect. So yeah, le le just like you went to the store. Yeah. Can I have a land please? Yes. Yep. The answer is yes. I would even expand that a little bit more and say you've you've done one in a green, you get a land into play, but you've also spent a card in hand and you're getting a card in your graveyard. Right. So right? You, there's an, an uh, additional cost of a card and there's an additional benefit sometimes of sorcery in yep. graveyard too, which also could matter. Yeah. For delirium yep. or for spell mastery or whatever, Emmer right? Cool. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, there's also costs on cards in addition to the cost of cast a card. So let's take like a Planeswalker, like Ugin mm -hmm. the Spirit Dragon, right? Of course, it's eight mana to just get it out there. So that's a cost we just talked about with Rampant Growth. But he also has other costs associated with different abilities on the card. Yes. So, and this is something a lot of people don't know about Planeswalkers, but even the plus abilities are a cost. Yes. The cost is just to add a loyalty. So even if you plus Ugin and Lightning Bolt something, uh, that is a cost of adding one loyalty to Ugin. And that is, I think, obvious to most people that that is a cost. Mm -hmm. But the other cards, like um, my my favorite, the Tim, right? Mm -hmm. You play Tim. Uh, it obviously costs the mana to cast Tim, and you get a you, know, you get a one one creature. But then when summoning sickness is gone, you can also tap Tim and deal one damage to something. So the cost mm -hmm. of that is like I can't block with Tim. Yep. Um, so I've used him once. I can only do that once by himself. Mm -hmm. like, so now I've used it. And if somebody else plays another 1-1 one, one that I want to kill, I can't do it now until yeah. my next turn. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then some some costs are, you know, it, it, there's magic cards. on Every magic card under the sun has a different effect, right? And some effects can get really weird. Like a personal favorite card of mine is Braid of Fire. Oh, yeah. And that has a cost upkeep on it. Cost. Cumulative upkeep, add mana to your mana pool. Right. Add one, <laughs> then two, then three, then four <laughs> on successive turns. Yeah, cumulative upkeep uh, used to have, I mean, it was around when mana burn happened. So mm -hmm. that was kind of supposed to be a downside. A right? Eventually, it'll get to be seven mana and you can't spend it. Mm -hmm. And like that never happens, actually. You could always spend the mana. Yeah. Because it's during upkeep, it's only on instants and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting one. I also think like just a land tapping it for mana mm -hmm. is, is similar to Tim is the cost of you of getting the mana is using the land. Yes. Yeah. So I've used it now and I can't use it again later until mm -hmm. my next turn. So it's, it's just like closes the window of opportunity for you to use it at another point. Yeah. Either to make mana at a different point, or maybe you've got a land that has a mana ability as well as a non mana ability. Uh. So you can tap it for mana, but the cost is, the opportunity of utilizing the non man ability later on in your turn. Right, now I can't turn it into a creature, or I could, exactly. but it will be tapped and it can't block or mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even like actions like attacking have a cost. I think obviously when you tap the creature to attack, we're tapping it and using it, but even if it has vigilance, I still think there's the cost of attacking, which is you only have one attack step. Mm -hmm. So whenever you attack, you've now used your attack step and 
that is the cost of of attacking with something. There's also cards that care about whether you've attacked yep. or haven't attacked. And we've all been in that situation where it's like, this card cares about whether I attack or not, and I would like to attack before I do it so I can get this ability, but if I do that, that's bad and it's for some other reason, so now I just have to play the card and don't get the extra effect. Yeah, or your commander might care about attacking something like Timna the Weaver mm. or uh, Neheb to make mana in your post-combat main phase. Uh, stuff like that where, you know, again, like you say, it's really important from a sequencing standpoint um, to make sure that you're taking the correct actions in your pre-combat main phase, then attacking, then taking advantage of it in your post-combat main phase. Because if you do too much in the pre-combat or too much in the post-combat, you're not taking full advantage of utilizing that attack step. So this uh, this sort of tug and pull between, you know, the transaction cost of an effect, like what do I pay, what do I get, is like one of the foundational pieces of what ma makes magic what it is, right. and why it's a strategy game, because you're constantly sort of being like, is that effect worth the cost right now? Is it the best yes. thing I can be doing in the best order I can be doing it? Which is interesting. So let's talk about sort of how this relates to combo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... In the notes, you put down um, effects pay, effect pays the cost of an action. That is sort of how combos mm -hmm. work. From if you boil it all the way down, yes. then what the way combos work is the effect that you're getting, f you know, at the end of the combo actually pays for taking the action. Yeah, it's or, or to put another way, it's self sustaining, mm -hmm. right? In that you're putting in a certain amount of whatever. And you're getting at least that much out of it of the same type, type and quantity of what you put in. At least that much. Right. So that allows the action to be taken, quote unquote, infinitely. Right. As many times as you want to. Because the game doesn't have a natural stopper on, unless it says like, can only be activated once per turn or something mm -hmm. on an action. It just says, do you have the ability to pay for it? Yep. Yes. Then you can do it. Um, so usually these don't come on the same card. Sometimes they do. Uh, so to create this type of transaction, you have to combine like multiple actions usually or play cards that alter or modif modify the cost mm -hmm. or the effect. Or the effect, yeah. Yeah, until it sort of does what you need. So a simple, a very simple example of this, it does occur on one card. It is Basalt Monolith. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Basalt Monolith, uh, it's an artifact that taps and adds three colorless mana to your mana pool. And it also has an ability that allows you to untap it and the the cost of that untap is three mana. Mm -hmm. So you can technically tap the Basalt Monolith and then pay the mana to untap it, the mana that it created, as many times as you feel like. You can and just always yeah. do that. If you're a meme lord, if you're a meme lord like me, I, I just do that in game sometimes. You know, I'd like to respond by uh, tapping my basalt monolith to I'll untap it. it. Yeah. Okay. What else <laughs> are you doing? You just kind of feel like you're doing something in game. Some games, you know. Um, can you technically just stall, stall the game to a draw if you want to. So you can. Um, it depends who you ask. If you ask, and I'm sure there are going to be plenty of judges in the comments sounding off about this, but if you're not advancing your game state at some point, you do have to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, everybody. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. So <laughs> once, once or twice is funny, but that's about it. <laughs> um, okay, so Basalt Monolith can tap and untap itself as many times as you want, but it doesn't do anything inherently. Mm -hmm. And there aren't really any cards that say whenever, um, you know, an artifact you control becomes tapped, do this, but that is a way that you could turn that into a an advantage, right? Because I can tap and untap it as many times as I want. And now if I can play another card that gives me some sort of marginal advantage from doing that, now it suddenly becomes, well, any marginal advantage multiplied over um, infinity is going yes. to be a large advantage. And we can see this with cards like, and Basalt Monolith needs no introduction, right? It, right. it, 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 it has a notorious combo yeah. card. But Keenan. Bonder Prodigy mm -hmm. makes, anytime you tap an artifact for mana, it creates one extra mana. So, hey, Basalt Monolith doesn't make three anymore, makes four. Right. But it only casts, costs three to untap it. So, yeah. we can see where that leads, right? You just do that a million times, I got a million mana. Yep. Yep. So, you're amplifying the effect in that situation, yeah. right? So, it still costs the same, but you're getting a little more out of it each time. Now, another way to go about this is to make it cost less to untap the Basalt Monolith. And Zerda, the Dawn Waker, does that. It makes the ability cost less. Uh, it's not the ability of tapping it to make three mana, but the ability of untapping it. So now you're right. getting three, but you're paying less than three to untap it. That is also a, a recipe for infinite mana. Right, same net effect, right? Yeah. You're reducing the cost or increasing the, the effect by one in both cases.
Rings of Bright Hearth is another one that'll do a similar thing in a different way. It's actually copying the untap effect. Mm -hmm. So now you basically pay five mana to untap it twice. Yes. But it costs six, but it gives you six mana when you untap it twice. Mm -hmm. So again, you're up one mana and you just say, I do that a million times. Um, another example of this is, and this is different because it doesn't, it's not two cards, or sorry, there's no single card in here that goes infinite with itself. But Two cards that go infinite together is Savage Vent Maw and Aggravated Assault. Right. Savage Vent Maw will create on attack red, 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 green, green, green. Mm -hmm. And then Aggravated Assault says, oh, if you have red, red, green, green, you can pay that and create an extra combat step and mm -hmm. untap your creatures. So just by swinging with Savage Vent Maw, you create the mana that then pays for you to have another attack, which allows you to swing again with Savage Vent Maw and create the mana to have another attack, and you can see where that leads. Yeah, so you can kind of see the overarching theme here is you've got an action you want to take that costs you some amount, and then the result of taking the action is enough to keep doing it, right? Yep. Yeah. The same theory kind of with Godo and Helm of the Host, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, oh, make another Godo. That allows me to attack again. Oh, mm -hmm. but then, then when I go to attack again, I make another Goto, which allows me to attack again, and it's the same yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I wanted to do a, talk about another kind of combo here that people will talk about in the combo space. And most of this episode is really dedicated to what we call infinite combos. Infinite combos, yeah. Yeah, but there are a combination of cards that um, don't go infinite, but they're still combo-y. They, they lock out the game for your opponents generally. So I'll call them opponent lockouts. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't mean synergy, right? There are cards that just work really well together and they have a big effect, but they're not infinite. It's not like you're taking an action 5,000 times. Yeah. It's just taking one action that's very, very big. And this is kind of maybe more similar to that, but I just wanted to address it. Um, opponent lockout combos, people don't tend to like these. They tend to be kind of mean because they usually end in like your opponents can't do anything. Yeah, it's a very frustrating place to be. Yeah. Very, very frustrating. But these sure. are combos that I would say are worth looking out for. It's like Lavinia, Azorius Renegade. Mm -hmm. um, with, uh, or Teferi, Mage of Zelfir. Yeah, with can, Knowledge Pool. Knowledge Pool and Omen Machine. So these yeah. basically say, hey, opponents, you either can't play spells at instant speed or you can't play spells at no mana cost. Mm -hmm. And then there's another card that sort of forces them to play at instant speed or cast spells without paying their mana cost mm -hmm. instead of whatever they're casting and it just the the net outcome of both of those is opponents can't do anything they can't cast any spells yeah they could still activate abilities i guess they're on board but if there are if those aren't already killing a lavinia or a teferi well then you're you're done yeah you're not going far yeah um there's also like the new Aerith tormented prophet which instead of drawing cards you um exile two cards from the top of your library and then you can yep. play them and then Possess Portal, which stops people from drawing cards, yep. but you're not drawing cards, so it's the same thing. Like, hey, nobody can draw cards for the rest of the game, except you. Tends to win you the game. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Archon of Emeria and Possibility Storm. This is another lockout combo that makes it so just... Because your your opponents can only play one spell each turn, but the way Possibility Storm is, you cast a spell, then it says, instead of that spell, cast a spell out of here. And you're like, I already cast my one spell per turn, though. So I can't cast that second spell. So that, that locks out. You get one and that's it. Yeah. And then there's, of course, like Stasis Locks. Which yes. are just like nobody untaps anymore. Yes. Well, sometimes except for you. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. commonly played in Derevi, yep. where it allows you to untap your lands to pay for the cumulative upkeep of stasis just to keep it out. So you're just like, hey, I can keep stasis up forever. Yeah. And y'all are all tapped out. So are yeah, we done or here? Yeah, you've got some other way to untap things like an unwinding clock. You're untapping your mana rocks Fairy. to cast stuff or whatever. Man, Teferi's yeah. a real jerk about this kind of stuff, isn't he? Teferi. The different real, versions. Real cool in-game character. <laughs> real oppressive in-game character. <laughs> Turns out. Okay. But we're not going to talk about lockouts as much mm -hmm. and these type of combos. We're really concentrating on infinite combos here. Mm -hmm. So why is this useful to know about the infinite combo stuff? I think, you know, understanding this idea of like, hey, if I can get the cost of something to be the outcome of the effect of the thing that I paid for originally, yep. then I might be onto something as far as a combo. Yeah. Yeah. So like when I'm looking through new sets, new magic sets, right? I can look at a card and be like, oh, that, that combos with something. I don't know what yet, but it comes with combos with something. Because this has the earmarks of what would make a combo possible. Yeah. yeah. Or I, same thing when you're playing in game. Yeah. Yeah. You can be in the middle of the game. Actually, I like what you said earlier, which is like, hey, you're often stealing stuff or mm -hmm. I don't know. I've, I've built decks for sure before where in the middle of the game, I realized like I didn't design this or think of this, but this is going to go infinite now. That's really satisfying. Yeah. It, well, it, it just means you had a lot of good synergy, but very yeah. often you're like, oh, Orvar, this happens to me all the time. And I've purposely tried to build my Orvar deck so it doesn't go infinite. And it's mm -hmm. so hard to do that because it goes infinite in so many ways. Well, I'll just be in the middle of something and go, oh crap, I'm infinite. Because when I do this, it's actually going to reset me to a point where I can just do that yep. again. Yeah. Um, 
but I like what you said there. It helps with building around uh, a cards or cards that you like too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the roadmap with what you need to make a combo. Like I, like my Tim deck that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you know, that is not a powerful strategy, right? Like yep. It is tapping creatures to do things that is slow. Yep. And one of the ways I get around it is, yeah, there are combo type things you can do with Staff of Domination and other things mm-hmm. to like, so you can actually attain victory and Tim everybody to death technically. Yeah. So in that situation, you're taking the, the cost, which is tapping your creature, and then you're somehow coming up with an outcome that says, I'm going to untap my creature, get it back in the state it was before. And still have all the resources to tap it again yes. and get it back. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, it also, I think, helps with threat assessment in game if you understand how combos work. Big time. You know, certain cards sort of can look innocuous in a vacuum and are notorious combo pieces. That's a line he wrote, by the way. Uh, yeah. So some examples are Draw Scorpion. Yep. That's a notorious combo card. Mm-hmm. It is that the one that when an artifact dies, you untap something? You untap something. Anything that says when something happens, untap something. Untapping is yeah. a combo. <laughs> Intruder Alarm is another untapping yep. thing. Yep. yep. Uh, stuff like Paragon Drake, though, mm-hmm. which is like ETB untap five lands. Mm-hmm. This is a way to create often infinite mana with certain combos. Um, so in game, if you see a draw scorpion come out and they say pass turn, you have to like the spider sense has to really be tingling at that moment right yeah especially when they're older cards like if it's a pre-con if it's a, a combo piece that happens to be in a recent pre-con maybe a bit of a different story but right they went out like, of their way to find draw scorpion yeah, draw scorpion is not in pre-cons today <laughs> <laughs> so you know that they put it in their deck for a reason and nine times out of 10, that's going to be common. 99 times out of a hundred. You can quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a draw scorpion that somebody's just like, I just get value with it. I it's wanted to all... leave the door open yeah. just in case somebody's going to be like, oh, in my scorpion tribal deck, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> one more scorpion and that was it. <laughs> If you have a Scorpion tribal deck, I want to see you in the comments. <laughs> I want to know about Sound it. I, Somebody's and not it, right? just, you can't just say, yes, I have one. You have to give, you have to provide a link mm-hmm. to the entire deck list. Including so, Draw Scorpion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I like what you said about helping with new card evaluation sort mm-hmm. of during preview season, because we do this every single set, both yes. of us, right? Because we are content creators. So when mm-hmm. new cards come out, we're constantly like evaluating and trying to do our best job to help present our evaluations to the to the audience so that we can hopefully help you all along and figure out what is possible with a lot of the cards um i think a king kenrith is like a super good example Mm -hmm. of how to sort of think about a card in a combo space because king kenrith has a bunch of abilities that you can basically repeat as much as you want if you get infinite mana you know if you listen to limited resources or something like that they're they're assessing these cards within the context of a limited environment and i think when you're assessing cards in the context of edh combo viability or combo potentiality if you want to call it that is a huge part of assessing cards in edh because you need to know what's out there right even if you don't intend to play it yourself knowing what you might come up against in a game is really really important yeah because we're constantly threat assessing what's going on and so i want to know like how easy or hard is it to combo with that card almost Mm -hmm. every card there is a conceivable combo you could come up with once you get to four five six right cards other cards working with it but that's not like a scenario that you really have to be worried about is there a, a two or three card you know, is there one other card that just combos with this card? Or is there two other cards together that mm-hmm. combo with this card? That That is legitimate to worry about. Mm-hmm. So looking at Kenrith, um, Kenrith's abilities, and if you're watching YouTube, this is going to be a little easier because you can uh, look at it on screen. But mm-hmm. let's look at like his second ability, which is one in a green, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. Okay, I got so, some good ones. Yeah, so the first thing, let's say that you look at this card for the first time ever. Yep. What are you thinking? What's your thought process with how could I combo with that specific ability? So I I would definitely go to a space where we're using plus one, plus one, plus one counters as a resource for something, yep. right? Something like Crystalline Crawler, where you're yep. removing the counters to get mana. Yep. Um, maybe a card, uh, I don't know, it's a green grub from uh, Stranglehold. I don't know what it's called. Um, Hold on. It, it's, uh, I think it's called Spike Feeder. Is that, the, is that real? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, do you remove mana? Uh, you remove counters from it to make mana? It's, it's part of an infinite yes, life yeah, combo, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah a notorious combo card, Spike Feeder, actually, uh, removes uh, uh, plus one, plus one counters to gain life. Uh, so if you can work that in somehow. If you can, okay, so you move counters, make life, and if the make life could... You could pay life to make some mana, maybe through something like Treasonous Ogre. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of these are, are like, they're lossy. You know what I mean? In that, you like, bleed off a little bit of the resources as you go. Yeah, so you need some piece in there to sort of modify it to bring it back in line, so that you're getting out what you're putting in. 
But um, ultimately, uh, you're trying to turn the plus one plus one counter into enough mana to pay for Cranworth's mm-hmm. plus one plus one counter ability. And right. if you can come out even or ahead on that yes. exchange, yeah. Imagine there was a creature that said, "Remove a plus one plus one counter, create you know three mana of any color." So we uh, something like Cryptic Trilobite. There that, you go. Uh, that you makes can two to make two to activate abilities, and that feeds into Kenrith's ability. Obviously, you need the green, obviously, so you got to jump through some additional hoops. But that's a way that you're going to be yeah. mana even, mm-hmm. right? Or maybe you're playing something like uh, uh, what are we? Microsynth Lattice. Does that allow you to uh, activate abilities with any color of mana? Players may spend mana as though or mana of any color. Period. So you, so you can totally do. So it. with the Cryptic Trilobite and and Microsynth Lattice, um, that's just self-contained there, but it will yes. only it will only net you. Even, that's right? even, right? So, like, I pay two, put a 1-1 counter on it, remove the counter, get two. Yep. That's, so that's not actually doing it yet. Yeah. But the but, other way to go is to is to create, in the transaction, make it so that I'm getting more than one plus one plus one counter. Yes, hardened so hardened scales. So hardened scales, yep. doubling season, doubling something season, like that, sure. will make it so that, oh, I pay two, but I actually get two plus one plus one counters. Yeah. And now with Cryptic Trilobite, I'm removing, you know, one counter to stay even and one staying on, so I'm kind of getting somewhere with all of this right yeah and the great thing about canrith is if i do get somewhere i can turn that into all his other abilities as many times as i feel like gain yes. infinite life yeah or whatever yeah. yeah and i think from here the real question becomes like the most efficient way mm-hmm. what are the cards that get you there with the you know the least amount of cards and the least total mana cost among those cards yeah. right and in your colors too because oh, one of point. the things well, that Kenrith, um, he doesn't have to worry about it when we're talking about um uh you know certain combos and certain color combinations certain cards are more available in certain colors and like you know artifacts are great in blue mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. um but you know if you're looking at rakdos it might be kind of tough to re- reliably or consistently get an uh an artifact into play yeah it could be tough Right, but if you're in five color, if you're in Kenrith, then you know obviously the world's your oyster. But that's one of the reasons Kenrith is not good. <laughs> Let's talk about some uh, other examples from recent years that are sort of obviously combo and why that's the case. So Heliod mm-hmm. Suncrown comes to mind. Hey, that combos with uh, a, a green ground from Stranglehold. Wow, <laughs> or from Stronghold. <laughs> it, it definitely does. Um, okay, so Heliod. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says, whenever you gain life, put a 1-1 counter on target creature or enchantment you control, and then you can pay one in white to give another target creature lifelink until end of turn. Mm -hmm. We know what this combo's with, Mm -hmm. Triskelly and Walking Ballista, a lot of stuff. Um, When you saw this card for the first time, though, what was your thought process? My my thought process is... um it's got a trigger that's repeatable. And this is actually something that, that WotC has been changing in recent yeah. sets in terms of design is they've been making things only trigger once per turn. Yeah. And that's a deliberate design choice to limit the combo potential yeah. of cards, right? So when something like with Heliod, gaining life repeatedly in a turn is generally something that you can do fairly easily. Right. Even outside of a combo, right? You might have 10 1-1 one, one tokens with lifelink, right? 10 life gain yep, triggers yep, yep. right so when you're looking at something uh, a a trigger that's easily triggered and can be done repeatedly over the course of a turn high combo potential just in general yep um plus one plus one counters just as we mentioned in the last example um also very high combo potential because there are plenty of cards that allow you to convert or, or transact you know uh plus one plus one counters for some other resource you, you know? can draw cards off of them yep. you can create mana off of them you can mm-hmm. fog off of them you yep. can like all kinds of stuff yeah 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 it's a it's a um uh, a currency that you can use for a lot of different effects yeah so so heliod the first thing i thought of was like oh well if i can have the creature that's dealing deal damage by using the counter yeah right and that's mm-hmm. that's and that is how we found a lot of the combos that actually end up getting used. But mm-hmm. again, like you said, well, as soon as it's got lifelink, it's got lifelink forever. Mm-hmm. So if putting a counter on it is, you know, is uh, put there because of the damage, then all I need now is the damage to be because of the counter. Exactly. And then now I've got that loop you talked about. Yeah, you've improved your exchange rate there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because the damage will ultimately itself lead to the win, I don't need another step. Yeah. I don't need to create mana out of it. I don't need to be, I can be even with that transaction. One damage, one counter. One damage, one counter, one damage, one counter. Well, the damage mm-hmm. will kill my opponents. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, Port Razor is another newish card that just keeps popping up as yeah. like it combos with this and that. And I think a lot of it has to do with the particular wording on Port Razor that's different than a lot of cards like this? Yes. Uh, we actually just did a video on this on Port Razor with, um, uh, with Olivia Gobert-Hicks. Oh, our friend. Uh, yeah. It, it, with Port Razor, the interesting thing, uh, one of the things that you can look at when you're uh, trying to assess combo potential with a card is uh, you can look at restrictions that are put on a card to prevent 
combo viability, which in this case, Port Razor, it only allows you to uh, attack one player per turn with the, or sorry, one player, each once, player, once, each each player once per turn, yeah. right? It's a, here, I'll read it real quick. When Port, when Port Razor deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there's an additional combat phase. Port Razor can't attack a player it has already attacked this turn. So in a four player game, nominally, it should mean you can only attack Jim once, Jimmy once, and then Megan once, and then right. that's it. It's attacked each other player, so it should have to stop now. Yep. But if you can uh, move it to a different zone and move it back, then it's a new permanent. Resets the counter. So uh, Olivia Crimson Bride actually does this card from yep. uh, Crimson Vow. Uh, it will actually, you can sacrifice it if you have a sacrifice outlet. You can sacrifice it after it does damage in your end of combat step. And then uh, Olivia Crimson Bride will bring it back and you can uh, attack yeah, again in your she next. She brings it back on attack. Yeah. And then s says, oh, you're here now. Will you please, once you deal damage, I'm going to get another attack. And then before that attack, I'll just sack the port razor so it's back in the graveyard again. Right. And you can just sort of do that forever, provided that you have uh, open attacks. Yeah, the game treats it as a new game object. It has no memory of who it attacked as it was, uh, you know, in previous lives. Uh, Jessica's Will is another card that continuously pops mm -hmm. up. And this one, I got to admit, when I saw Port Razor and Helio at Suncrown, and I was like, yep, infinite combos, I can see them. Jessica's Will, I thought it was really good, but the more I played with it, the more I was like, oh, crap, it does all this other stuff. <sighs> does it ever. <laughs> it might actually end up being the best card from um, Commander Legends, even if you count Jeweled Lotus, Opposition Agent, and Hole Breacher, which is now banned. I actually think Jessica's Will is a better card than Hole yeah. Breacher. Yeah, I would Hole say Breacher so. is sort of stronger at its strongest, but in your average deck, you want Jessica's Will in all of them. I don't know. Jessica's Will... Mm. I might take some heat for this, but I'm, I'm going out on a limb. I would say that Jessica's Will is stronger than Hall Breacher. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I was talking with Gavin Verhey about it and he yeah. was like, I was like, it's, I think it's the most powerful card since Dockside Extortionist that's been printed. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. For sure. So he was like, really? I think he asked on Twitter and it was close, but I think oh, it's wild to me. Especially yeah. since, you know, with these cards where the, they're not color gated, they can come yeah. down a lot earlier in games because it's so easy to make colorless mana Sol Ring, right? Yep. On turn one and suddenly turn two, your desk is willing with a little bit of mana left over. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's got high combo potential just because, you know, there's stuff that lets you play instants from your graveyard. You can get instants back if you can make a ton of mana. And then maybe, um, what do we got? Archaeomancer to return a sorcery to your hand, recast it. You just sustaining that loop, right? You might need a way to sack and replay the Archaeomancer or bounce it back to your hand or something, but... It also combos with a lot of things that mana guys are do, like mm -hmm. reiterate and things like that. If mm -hmm. somebody's got seven cards, then you can be mana positive on a reiterate and you can yep. go infinite on mana with Jessica's Will and it's simultaneously drawing your, your whole deck while you do that. So it also gives yeah. you the cards to play with mm -hmm. the mana that you're creating. Yeah, that one was not as obvious, I got to admit, mm -hmm. but those are things to look for all right let's talk about um the next step of sort of figuring out how combos work and building combos is c figuring out what are combo friendly effects so there are certain effects that in magic are sort of easier to combo with than others like scorpion tribal is pretty hard mm -hmm. to combo with um but plus one plus one counters which we've talked about a bunch already are very easy to combo with so that yes. is a known thing that like hey if you're dealing with plus one plus one counters you're probably going to have some ways to go infinite in there mm -hmm. um, other ones are card draw card draw always yeah. That's another one of those things that you can treat like currency, right? We've got things like um, yeah. Familiar. Uh, real quick, Scourge Familiar is four and a black for a 3-2 flyer, but you discard a card and you get uh, black mana. A black mana. Yep. Right? So that's another one of those situations where you can treat your cards like resources. Yep. Just trade them for mana. Yeah. Straight up, one to one. So now if you have a thing that's going to let you draw a lot of cards, it's going to create a lot of mana. And, and you lets turn. you cast the cards. Yeah. Kind of like the Jessica's Will example, right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, ETB effects are also notorious for sort of going infinite because it's not that hard to find a way to just constantly blink it, like Dead Eye Navigator or mm -hmm. Eldrazi Displacer. Um, you know, just Brago in general will just allow you to... Yeah, well, and kind of in the Port Razor example, moving zones kind of resets a lot of things that are designed to prevent combos. So though that act of blinking or sacrificing a creature and reanimating it, just moving it to a different zone and then bringing it back is a really good way to reset that combo counter. Yeah, you know? it can break a lot of the safeties that they have in place. The safeties, yeah, yeah I like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice also, like, not just combo-friendly effects, but there are combo-friendly cards, just cards that sort of come up over and over in combo discussions. Mm -hmm. We've already mentioned a lot of them, um, but the altars, Astronaut's Altar, Phyrexian Altars, uh, Food Chain is a card that just mm -hmm. constantly comes up on every CDH board. I feel like every commander that comes out that has green in it is like, 
there's a discuss has to be a discussion about like is this a better food chain commander than the other commanders out there like it's like i mean they can't all be the best one that happened in rapid fire succession we went from tazri to uh niv Mizzet Mizzet. reborn yep. to the first sliver in the course of like three months yeah, like, it was just like, about whiplash. Oh, every new commander is the best food yeah. chain commander i guess <laughs> um then there's like helm of the host often comes up in combo stuff because it's doing something that's not meant to be done which is like copying legendaries and allowing you to have more than one of them yep and because of you, it's not that hard to get additional combats. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sage of Hours is one that comes up a lot because yeah. now you're trading 1-1 one, one counters for extra turns and mm-hmm. infinite extra turns is a very easy way to win the game. That's a pretty powerful transaction, some might say. <laughs> Freed from the Real is another one. Mm-hmm. Pemendora, um, these are cards that allow you to trade mana for untapping a certain uh, creature and mm-hmm. that can obviously be broken. Uh, so knowing sort of what the key notorious you know most wanted combo cards are that are on the board you know that the, the yeah. fbi is most wanted of like we all of these are combo are uh all of these are wanted for their you know all the combos they've caused over the past mm-hmm. you know you, you the whole board of them is is important to knowing what's because if somebody goes food chain go i mean yeah first of all nobody would ever really do that but like if they did you are dead on your ne- their next turn. This is alarm bells. Yeah. It's a situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, like, there's no scenario under which you are alive if they mm-hmm. take another turn. Mm-hmm. So you just have to know what those cards are. Ashnod's Altar is a tricky one because they can play it so early. I know. Yeah, it's like, well, it's one of those free sack outlet things, right? Yeah. Free sack outlets are, are uh, combo city, yeah. right? Ashnod's Altar, Phyrexian Altar. Goblin um, Bombardment even. Goblin like, Bombardment. You're probably going to die to that, yeah. Viscera Seer. Yep. Like all of these cards that allow you to move a creature from one zone to another. At no mana cost. At no mana cost. Um, okay. There was another thing about anatomy of a combo, and we've kind of alluded to it here, but I liked how you put this, which was work backwards. Mm-hmm. So combo is about resetting board states. If you know what things look like sort of before and after you take an action, then the trick in designing a combo is to get that the after to look like the before exactly yeah yeah so uh, the olivia example i think is almost a perfect example of this right you Mm -hmm. have a board state and your board state is i have olivia i have a sack outlet and i have port razor in the graveyard Mm -hmm. i attack with olivia i bring port razor back with her trigger and now i hit a a, a deal combat damage to a player and port razor's ability triggers and i untap my creatures i'm going to get another combat phase Mm -hmm. now i'm almost to where i was before except port razor is still on the battlefield yeah so now if i just sack it it goes to the graveyard now i'm exactly where i was at the start of that right i haven't tapped any mana yeah and you've got a port razor that hasn't attacked that is the 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 beginning state of that combo right i guess technically you could go attack again another player untap attack again another player exactly untap then do the sacking yeah you don't have to do the sacking every time it doesn't really matter but i like the cleanness of like no mana gets tapped in any of that Mm -hmm. it's just like i need the port razor in the graveyard at the end of this and the sack outlet sort of gives you that piece yeah i just want to get back to the beginning and and so that's where the the sack outlet piece comes in because you could look at olivia and port razor and say we're real close to a combo here right but what do i need to get it back to that original state of the port razor in the graveyard and that's where the free sack outlet comes in and that's why a sack outlet like high market or something wouldn't work because it's mm-hmm. going to be effective right it's going to deal more damage and you'll get more extra combats but because now i have to tap my high market to sacrifice the port razor well the the after doesn't look exactly like the before it's close it's, it's close, close but now i have a land tapped that i didn't have tapped at the beginning of this and that tells right. you that this is untenable even if they i had all high markets in some weird world where i could copy my lands or whatever um i would eventually get to none because none of this uh action is untapping any of my lands in any right. way yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that as a way to look at it. If you can get the after to look like the before, then you're probably mm-hmm. onto some kind of combo. All right. Coming up, we are going to talk about how when you're in the game to identify that a combo might be coming uh, in order to figure out how to stop it, how to prepare for it. Or if you like combos and you're the combo player, like if you are the bad guy at the table, then maybe this will help you figure out how to sneak your combo in and mm-hmm. sort of steal victory more often. But before we get into that, we are going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. Frillies, 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 Frillies! Uh, Rubinia, what are you singing? Obviously, it's the song of Frillies! I actually requested a fur Elise. Tough! I'm a soul singer, not a jukebox. If you want to hear any song, learn an instrument! Of course, there's always Amazon Music. They have thousands of music stations and top playlists to stream for free. They even offer over 10 million free podcasts. 
with some available weeks early, like the hilarious, smartless, and Dr. Death Miracle Man, which is full of that true crime you humans love. And if, like me, you wish to play any song you desire, free of pesky ads, there's Amazon Music Unlimited, which grants access to over 75 million songs anywhere. Plus, when I wish to change songs, I merely order my robo-servant Alexa to change them for me. Ooh, play Freebird. Get out! If you've never tried Amazon Music Unlimited, now's a great time. For a limited time, new customers can try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months, no credit card required. Just go to Amazon.com slash command pod. That's Amazon.com slash command pod to try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months. Again, Amazon.com slash command pod. Renews automatically, cancel anytime, terms apply. All right, Josh, lady, we're rolling. How's it, everybody? Today we're reviewing, uh, what is this car? Is this car good? Oh, so tired. What's happening? It's a sleep spiral. Get this man some coffee stat. The channel depends on it. <laughs> ah, that is much better. Oh, and this card's bad. Another workday saved by trade. The coffee subscription service personalized to your taste. Just take Trade's coffee quiz and start your journey to the perfect cup. I'm a coffee noob myself, but Trade matched me with a delicious blend from Anodyne Roasting Co. Trade guarantees you'll love your first bag too. Plus you can give feedback, so as your preferences evolve, so will your matches. And with over 400 craft coffee selections, you'll never run out of options. For our listeners, right now, Trade is offering your first bag free and $5 off your bundle at checkout. To get yours, go to drinktrade.com slash command and use promo code command. Take the quiz to start your journey to the perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash command, promo code command for your first bag free and $5 off your bundle. And this holiday season, give the coffee lover in your life the gift of better coffee too with their own personalized gift coffee subscription from Trade. Enjoy. Hi there, I'm Kithion, hero of Akros. Okay, hero is a stretch. Really, I'm just a skinny Therosian kid who plays a lot of Mogus the Gardening. It's a card game. You'd like it. I want to be a hero, but I don't know the first thing about personal fitness. That is until I got my Peloton bike. With Peloton, getting in shape is as easy as pie. Exercising used to seem like a chore, especially around the holidays when we're busy planning festivals for the gods. But Peloton's exciting classes made fitness a joy. Their motivating instructors and curated playlists made every workout awesome, blasting away my anxiety faster than a storm deck can combo off. Plus, I never had to work out alone thanks to Peloton's interest groups like Peloton News newbies, Peloton Parents, or Peloton Beefcakes of Theros. I'm still petitioning for that one. And when I got my bike, it came with free access to Peloton's app. So wherever I go, Peloton is there to give me the structure and encouragement I need to attack fitness and transform into the battle-forged hero I always knew I could be. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. Or to learn how you could try Peloton classes for free for the rest of the year, go to OnePeloton.com slash app. New members only, terms apply. Peloton, when your workout is a joy, it's a joy to work out. All right, we're back. We are talking about all things combo. I've got Jim from the Spike Feeders here with me today. So we've gone over the anatomy of sort of how combos work. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to go to the next step, which is taking that knowledge and applying it to the game. Um... And I think that scenario that we laid out at the beginning where, you know, the game's just kind of going along, you feel pretty good, your life total's pretty high, and then boom, it just feels like somebody played a card and you didn't see it coming. And I think this happens early in Commander careers for a lot of people where they're like, I don't even really understand what happened, but I just died and it felt like the game wasn't close to over. And I think because you haven't had that experience a lot, it can just feel like out of nowhere, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of like that asymmetry of information, right? It's, a, you know, some players are a little bit more opportunistic about this than others, but, um, you know, not knowing what's coming and then reflecting on the game and saying, oh, I would have done something differently had I known. Right. Right? So uh, this is something that I feel really strongly about is that every commander player should learn this stuff so that they don't have those moments, right? Yeah. Even if you don't want to be a combo player, knowing what's coming is a really important thing. It's an important skill to have in the format. Um, so that's one of the things that we do quite a bit is we say like, this is how to, this is how to do the combo. This is how to execute the steps, but then this is how to disrupt it. You should know how to disrupt it too. Especially if you're playing the combo, you should know how other people are going to disrupt it. Yeah. Right? It works from both angles. It's yeah. Like, if whether you're doing it or, or, or trying to stop it, it, it helps you. Yeah. Um, on the spike first channel, there is a series called better know a combo. Mm -hmm. I actually did the voice for one of them. Uh, and 
for the Elsha one. Elsha top, yeah. Yeah, and it's really helpful. It will explain a combo to you, but also even if you know the combo, what I really like about it is what you said. It actually, you guys go through and say, okay, but here's how you might disrupt it and stop it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some combos, it can be hard to figure out the sort of right moment. Because there's a lot going on, right? Yeah. And this, they, they could have complex stacks where there's lots of things going on. You just say, well, I've got a spot removal, but what do I use it on or when? I like the in the old Dead Eye Navigator days before we really uh, most of us learned how it worked. It was this thing would happen all the time where it would come out, it would soul bound with something, and we'd be like, "Yep, yep, it's soul bound." And then they'd be like, "Okay, I activate it and I blink this thing," and you're like, "Ha ha! I'm going to kill the thing with my instant speed removal." And they're like, "Cool, activate Dead Eye again." Yeah, and you're like, "Oh." Well, that feels unbeatable. Well, then, in that case, what what my instant speed removal do? And then we learned, oh, when the soulbound trigger goes on the stack before the soulbound trigger is resolved, remove the thing. And they cannot activate it at that moment because the soulbound hasn't happened. And I find it even gets a little bit worse because a lot of the time when somebody presents a combo and they say, I'm going to win here, people just scoop up their cards. Yeah. They don't, they don't iterate through the combo. You find sometimes people don't even know how to execute their own combos, right? Definitely been where the player's like, I don't know. I read that this wins, but okay, show me. Because I don't... Right. You, yeah, you, you got to do it. Like, I don't know how that works. Yeah, like... We had a we had a gameplay episode once where Bill was going off with uh, Karmic Guide and Felidar Guardian, mm -hmm. right? To blink the Karmic Guide, bring it back into play, reset it as a new object, reanimate something. And, uh, you know, I, it just occurred to me, I was playing a really weird deck, and it occurred to me, I said, Karmic Guide has protection from black, right? And he says, yeah. And his is Japanese, so we're like yeah, going yeah. by memory here. And uh, I said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to cast Magical Hack and give it protection from white. And now you can't target it with and the fella. That's target awesome. with Feller Guardian. But it's that is that knowledge of the steps of the combo and what needs to be in place for this to work, and sort of leveraging what's what you have access to to be able to disrupt it. Okay, but the first step of all this, I think, is identifying a combo. Like we need to know that a combo might be coming. That mm -hmm. we're you know getting near the part of the game maybe where it would happen or that this player might be running some kind of combo and we have to start looking out for it. I think avoiding that feeling of like, I wasn't even aware that we were near the end of the game and this is yeah. this is about to happen. So I think that's a useful skill is is having that, like you called it a spidey sense before yeah. the game of like the game is about to end. We're getting close. Yeah. You know? How, yeah, your spidey sense needs to start tingling at certain moments. We're going to hopefully help you have your spidey sense sort of be more tuned. Mm -hmm. So... How can you tell if your opponent might be trying to combo? How do you recognize which cards might be part a key part of that combo? And I think there are certain warning signs that will kind of let you know that a combo might be coming. And one of them is just add mana effects. So I'm always worried if my opponent has something out that basically says just add mana. It has an effect that says if you get infinite mana... Mm -hmm. It, like you're basically going to win. And, and Kenrith is a really good example of that Yep. Uh, on a commander. So if they ever get infinite mana with some colored mana somehow mixed in there, they're going to win with Kenrith because they can gain infinite life, put infinite 1-1 one, one counters, bring infinite things back from the graveyard, blah, 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 draw infinite cards, Any number cast of all ways. the cards because they already have infinite mana. Yeah. Like, can, all of Kenrith's ability are good if you have infinite mana. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of cards that are like that. Thrasios is like this. Yep. Uh, Staff of Domination is uh, a notorious one. Mm -hmm. Aggravated Assault, which we mentioned earlier. There's stuff like Walking Ballista, mm -hmm. which is just like, oh, add as many counters as you want, remove all the counters, kill everybody. Um, Dead Eye Navigator, which we just talked about. Yep. Eldrazi Displacer. You also need something to blink with those things, so they're like a half a step removed. But they almost never would play that card until the moment they're going to yeah. do it anyway. And especially if you've got that kind of effect in the command zone, yes. right? Like Kenrith. if you, Thrasios, Kenrith, these are cards that you always have access to. This is the eighth card in your opening hand or eighth and ninth if you're playing partners, yep. right? So if it's always in the command zone, that should be setting off your alarm bells before the game even starts, Yeah, right? Just add mana in the command zone, we're probably playing combos. Maybe not, maybe not, but probably. So if anybody plays out an aggravated assault, there, you know, it costs a lot of mana to do what the aggravated assault combos generally do. So oftentimes they'll try and sneak a piece out, and sometimes it, it is the aggravated assault. Mm -hmm. If they do that, uh, these are just cards that you got to be aware. If you let them untap with that card, you may be dead. Yep. Aggravated assault, not necessarily, but maybe. Yep. That's it's high on the list, but it's not as high as like staff of domination, which I if somebody plays a staff of domination, they almost never because it's not very efficient. So they're almost never yeah. just like I'm going to pay a lot of mana to draw a card with it. Go like they're generally like diminishing returns, right? The first activation is not good value, yeah. right? Five mana, you know, or I guess it's ten mana for your first extra oh combat with aggravated assault, yeah. right? That's not a good rate, but three extra combats. You know, it's a little bit of a different story because you might be able to just straight up kill somebody. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you don't need to combo out necessarily. Yeah. Um, another thing uh, that I would look out for 
if they play these types of cards as they might sort of herald in a combo on either that turn or a successive turn are repeatable zero mana cost effects. Mm -hmm. So if some, if uh, they get something out or sorry, if they can get something for nothing on repeat, it's probably going to go badly for you later. So the altars, Ashna's altar for Exian altar. We talked about all the goblin bombardment, all the free sack outlets. Yep. No sack cost. outlets, big time. Yeah, sack outlets especially. But sack outs, uh, outlets that have a cost, I'm way less worried about. So even yeah. if it's like one black mana, sacrifice a creature, do something. Mm -hmm. The combo potential is way way lower because of the mana input that's required. So now they yep. need an additional step. Yeah, I guess there are a couple exceptions. We've got like grinding station, blasting station. They technically tap, I guess. But they have an untapped cost. They, they untap them. themselves. Yeah, right? yeah. Intruder alarm is a notorious mm -hmm. one, and this is one that they have to like ostensibly get a bunch of creatures into play to keep it going. But yep. again, this is a thing that's just going to happen every time they do a certain effect, mm -hmm. and they don't have to pay mana for it. Let's say intruder alarm to get the effect cost one mana. Mm -hmm. Not even close to as good, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. You might still be able to combo, but you need an additional hoop to jump through now. Yep, exactly. So, I mean, even even in those situations where, you know, if you can get intruder alarm, just making a token, let's say you can make a token for like one and a white. But if you've got, a, say, a mana dork that taps for the mana that you need to do that, your intruder alarm, every time the token comes in, it's going to untap your mana dork yeah. and you can do it again, right? Yeah, so any mana dork that could tap for two in yeah. some way, mm -hmm. yeah, could do it. Or so like I, the the one that taps and untaps two lands, let's say. Yeah, so like, I don't think I would call the mana dork a combo piece. It, it is definitely used in the combo, right? but it's definitely not the engine that's that's running it. It's you the know? intruder alarm. If you remove that piece of it, yep. though, there's a lot of redundancy for the other pieces, but there's yep. not a lot of cards like intruder alarm because yeah. they learned. Don't make cards like that mm -hmm. because people will do crazy busted things mm -hmm. um another one is a card uh that we haven't mentioned yet i'm surprised is ether flux reservoir oh boy this card is great i love <laughs> this card so much <laughs> like let me tell you um with aether flux reservoir one thing that i would look at for that kind of thing is you know if you're gonna gain life for casting spells then how many spells can you cast right how can you do this an infinite number of times to gain an infinite number of life and then have Aetherflux Reservoir be able to close out the game, right? That's the crazy thing about that card to me is that they were like, also put the win condition on it. Yeah, it does it all. So all it does <laughs> is say, yeah, how many spells can you cast? And there mm -hmm. are a lot of ways to cast infinite spells. We just talked about Jessica's Will Reiterate, mm -hmm. Mana Geyser Reiterate. Uh, there's Bergy and any number of things. Yep, Ice Crown Scepter, Dramatic Reversal is another yep. one. So you can just easily, well, I mean, quote unquote easily, but it's not mm -hmm. super hard to get um, Aetherflux Reservoir to just be like, oh, I cast as many spells as I feel like, I have mm -hmm. as much life as I want, and I just laser beam all of you to death. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, Bolus's Citadel is oh. a personal favorite of mine. With, with top two. Ooh. <laughs> and then <laughs> you get Aetherflux and it pays for the um, the life that you're spending to cast out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're making the output look like the input in that situation. Um, okay. And the, the third category of how to identify a combo is if just somebody has access to a lot of mana. So with enough of mana available, players can often have no visible pieces on the board, but they can deploy everything they need mm -hmm. for the win in one turn. So like if you're on turn four or five, generally, especially in casual, not so much in, uh, in CADH, um, if people have four or five mana available, it's, it's pretty difficult to get to a win from that starting position. Mm -hmm. I think once people get about to about eight mana is when, okay, now they've got enough initial uh, horsepower Mm -hmm. to get them over the hill to 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 play two cards in a row that start the ball rolling and maybe kill us all right now yeah well if you think about the power level that you're playing at right think about the average converted mana cost of the decks that you're playing if you're playing at a deck that has a, an average converted mana cost or average mana value mm -hmm. i should say of yeah. four then that value is eight right? right that's your two cards per turn on average every turn yeah and most of the uh, stuff we're talking about is two cards right, right. yeah like there's some three but mm -hmm. so you know you should know that by the time you get to eight mana available on board, they can cast two spells on their turn without you getting to untap, right? Yeah. In CDH, it's the same thing, but the average converted mana cost values are one to 1.5. So that number is three mana, yeah. right? Or four mana. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a different way of looking at it, but it's really the same concept, just sort of truncated for, for faster decks. So once you, it, a lot of times you'll be in games and somebody will get out to a f super fast start. They'll, you know, get their soul ring, they'll go into a signet, they'll maybe have one other accelerator on turn two, and mm -hmm. now they're on turn four with seven, eight mana, mm -hmm. and you're it literally could be like lights out right then because yeah. that is possible. Now, most casual decks aren't built to do that, and if they haven't tutored or something, it's unlikely they have the right pieces, but 
that is when I would already start to worry. Like we could, we could be dying. It's not like I expect it, you know, yeah. in that scenario, but it's definitely possible. And even if it's not a combo, it could be something else, right? Yeah. It could be some other giant advantage piece that you still need removal or disruption or counter magic or whatever to deal with. You, it should be setting off those same alarm bells, whether it's for combo or for something else. Yeah. If I have some way to get ready for this, yeah. I should Start because thinking it's about going it. to be bad. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it is. Um, you brought up an, a, another cool way to identify a combo. Um, sorry, that was the end of access to a lot of mana because I don't think right. it needs a lot of discussion, right? Like. I, I, I yeah. guess the only thing is like later in the game you get, and we'll uh, address this in a second to the point where like everybody has a lot of access to mana mm -hmm. so that it's like everybody could be winning at any time. Yeah. And it's, it, yeah. that's frequently the way it happens, right? right. Is that, uh, you know, you're sort of doing the standoff situation right. where everybody's like, and then the game just ends. Right. right? <laughs> All right. But the, 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 the last category of sort of how you identify a combo that you brought up, which I really like mm -hmm. is pregame discussions. So, if you're having the rule zero discussion, the power level discussion before the game, a great way to identify if people might have combos in their deck is just to straight up like ask them. Yeah, you can ask. You're allowed yeah. to use your words. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is good too because generally like decks that are going to purposefully combo are powerful and probably more powerful than you would expect in a normal casual game. And it's not saying like, hey, don't play that. It's like, oh, it's that's good to know. A lot of times I'll find that out. Like somebody bring out a deck and I'll, you know, they'll they'll bring out, I don't know, their um their Arixmithy's deck or whatever. I'm like, do you have Freed from the Real and Pemmensor in there? And they're like, yes, okay, cool. That's fine. I'm not telling you not to do that, but I need to play a different deck than I'm about to play. Yeah. Because this deck cannot, you know, is is not going to win that early and isn't trying to combo out. And I'll go get my deck yeah. with a little more interaction or that's a little more powerful. Yeah. So it sets kind of an expectation in your mind of like, I have to be worried about this starting from turn five, theoretically for Eric Smithies, right? Yeah. Because I could curve Eric Smithies into Freed from the Real and then make infinite mana and potentially end the game somehow, right? Right. But it's saying, I am playing a combo in this deck. I'll give you a general idea of what it is and uh, when it's coming, right? That that actually makes for a really good pregame discussion, right? This is what I'm doing. This is about when I'm going to do it. And this is what you should be prepared for, right? I think you can also just do it during the game. For sure. So we had a game that happened the other day and uh, one of our, Shauna, who's one of our new editors, she's playing a Nimrus deck. Another player casts Telepathy okay. and their hands get revealed. Uh -huh. And in her hand, I see Teferi Mage of Zalfir mm -hmm. and a Vampiric Tutor. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm playing a Joyra deck, which suspends things, so Teferi is very bad for me. But also, yeah. I'm like, immediately, I look at her hand and I look at her and I go, are you playing Knowledge Pool or Omen Machine in your deck? Yep. And she was like, maybe with a big smile which meant yes you know if somebody goes like this maybe yeah you can interpret that as yes for sure and so i was like cool i'm not mad about it mm -hmm. but i i'm glad i know that now because now we really need yeah. to figure out how to either stop the fairy for coming down kill it right away or stop that vampiric tutor maybe or like at least be ready yeah and you know i expressed this to the other players and you know we were we did manage to stop it but in that moment thinking now about it it's really tough for shauna not to give me the information i need because imagine what has to occur i have to ask her that question and she either has to bold face lie which is hard for most that human be beings to do to another human being yeah like imagine you asked me a question and i was just like straight up was like no even in that situation i feel like you would still no, like at least 30% of the time. For sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I find a lot of the time in, in, in game, especially, or even any social interaction, a lot of the feel bads are going to come from the difference between expectation and result. Right. So if you go in with a certain set of expectations and the result is something totally different, you're going to say, oh man, I wish that hadn't happened that way. Right. right? Um, sometimes that's a good situation, but a lot of the time it's bad. If you go in and you say, this is my expectation right now. I'm going to ask you a question to see if I can kind of refine that a little bit and you outright lie, you're setting me up to have an, an outcome that's different than my expectations. Right. And it's kind of a kind of crappy thing to do. You know, the correct answer in that situation, if you don't want to give the information is just to go, I don't know. You're gonna have to find out. Yeah. But by the way, that's a yes. They have it in the deck. I plead the fifth. <laughs> Be ready for that question. Yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you brought up another thing here, which I think is really smart. You can also just ask the other players at the table. Yeah. They might know that player better than you. They might know, have played against the deck before. Yep. They might just, you know, know things that you don't. And you could be, if they don't want to answer, you can be like, 
do you know does she have that combo in the right. deck have you guys played against this deck like yeah. how worried am i supposed to be yeah each player has three opponents yeah. right so if you, it's so that you know you the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah. kind of situation right so if somebody is threatening to end the game right away you've got two allies to help you out with this situation yeah because right? they're going to lose too so it's in their best exactly. interest to at least give you the information exactly yeah all right this kind of leads us into our next topic here which is threat assessment so once you're in the game you might have an inkling that a combo might be about to occur mm -hmm. you've identified it um and like I said, it can be hard because later in the game, everybody's got a lot of mana. Everyone's played a lot of stuff. There's probably a number of things that you're like, well, that could combo. That could maybe combo. This thing over here could combo. Like mm -hmm. that, there, I've definitely been in games where it's like, I don't know. Any person could win on their next turn. What am I supposed to do? Um, how do you properly threat assess these situations? And I think we've got some sort of bullet points that you can run down in your head to properly rank each of your opponents in your head as far as like, which is the most threatening that I have to watch out for the most. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I kind of think about is... How many cards has that player drawn mm -hmm. so far this game? Because if I'm worried about specific combinations of cards, and, and let's be under the assumption they haven't snuck out a, a known combo piece on the board. Obviously, right. if they have Aetherflux Reservoir on the table, I don't care almost what, el what else is going on. That player is the most dangerous, right? Yeah, and I mean, it, it, when you're in that kind of a situation, any card that they draw could be the next combo piece, right? right? Or they probably already have it, because why the heck did they play yeah. it out there? Yeah. You know, a lot of things you're thinking about. But let's say a situation where, like, I don't see any obvious well-known combo pieces out. Mm-hmm. If a, car, a player has drawn 20 cards in a game and the other players have just drawn, you know, five to seven, well, the player that drew 20 has a much higher chance of having the pieces. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Options are power in yep. EDH, honestly. Like, if you can increase your options by drawing cards and just having more things to do, um, you're always going to be in a better situation. So they, they might either have the cards assembled already or have a tutor and just be waiting, sitting on it to do it. You know, they, they definitely have been biding their time and they've, they've been carefully choosing what they want to do. Whereas the less... The options are sorry the players with the less options they've had less choices of what to do and they and oftentimes you know when you just have less cards you're kind of like don't you may only have like i can either do a or b whereas yeah. somebody's got 20 cards it's like i can do a b c d e f g yeah like i've got five mana yeah. and i've got a four drop and a three drop probably cast the four drop it's probably going to give me a bigger better yeah. thing but i can't do both so i have one option right yeah. <laughs> but if i have 12 cards in my hand i probably got you know three three drops a five drop yeah two two drops a one drop like my mm -hmm. options were very very open-ended in that case and i've been choosing the best one each time so i'm likely to have been setting up more right. than the other players yeah so drawing a lot of cards mm -hmm. spider sense mm -hmm. tingling another one is have they tutored Mm -hmm. tutoring is a really interesting one because sometimes you, they have to show you what they're tutoring for and sometimes they don't yes especially the tutors that they don't have to show you Oof, you have that's to rough. but here's the thing i find especially at casual tables is people don't when somebody tutors they don't that's no mark on any scorecard of threat assessment anywhere for most players yeah most players just totally disregard they're like yeah and then they move on to their turn and there's no nothing in their head that's like that player tutored you know, what do I do with the information I did get? Yeah. I know they searched through their deck and found something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a good um, thought process as far as tutors that I really liked. Yeah, it was, um, with tutoring is interesting because it's an opportunity. Every time somebody tutors, you have the opportunity to predict what they did right and you might not always know if you are correct or not sometimes you're making a prediction in game and then you know they just tutor and then they pass right. and then you're like oh that information's kind of obscured you could ask them in the in the post game chat if you have a post game debrief which i would encourage i think that's a great practice to get into but um you know if somebody says i'm going to cast war of invention x equals three right right i'm going to find an artifact from my library uh with converted mana cost three or less put it onto the battlefield i like to say you know, what would I do if I were in their situation? Knowing what I know, what's available to me, all the free information on the board, I don't know what's in their hand, I don't know what they're thinking of doing, right. all that kind of stuff. But knowing what I know, what is the best thing that I could pick out for this particular situation? And I find this is a really good practice to get into for like honing your threat assessment is making predictions and then deciding whether they were accurate or not. Because if I can say, they've got Aetherflex Reservoir on the field and they're playing a Demir deck, Right, and they say uh, War of Invention X equals six. Bolus is I'm thinking it's going to be Bolus is Citadel, yeah. right? <laughs> it, it is Bolus is Citadel, right? right? Yeah. Um, so, from the perspective of the person who's watching Tudor, that's a good way to get into that. But you can also throw off some sort of false breadcrumbs and say, look, if I'm going for something that's, you know, a two drop instead, 
right? Maybe I put a couple extra mana into my War of Invention to prevent my opponents from being able to accurately predict. Right, although it's War of Invention is coming on the battlefield, so I don't know that that's that useful. Yeah, it depends on whether you think they're going to counter it or not, yeah. right? But that's the kind of situation where predictions can make you a better player over a large number of games. I like to actually say it. So I will often yeah. like predict and be like, what are you getting, this? And like a lot of times they're like, yeah. Yeah, shot yeah. called. Yeah, yeah that, that's fun. <laughs> I, I think you can also like make some assumptions, some educated guesses based on like w at what point in the game the mm -hmm. tutor is happening. So very often a... Uh, vampiric tutor on turn two mm -hmm. into a, a Ristic study that they then play on yeah. turn three is almost always that's what they went and got. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but a vampiric tutor on turn one into a mana crypt on turn two is very o yeah. very often the case too, right? Yep, if sure. they if they tutor very early, they're almost always getting a setup cards, yep. you know, because that it's too early in the game to go for a win, so they're probably not going to find a combo piece. You know, again, you can't always know this because they might already have mana, mana crypt in hand, in which case maybe they are like, I don't want to waste my one mana on my first turn. I did mm -hmm. get my combo piece, but you can make educated guesses about what they're doing uh, in the cases where they don't have to show it to you. Whereas turn six, seven, they've already got a lot of mana. Set up, it's mm -hmm. unlikely that they're going to find a man rock in that case, right? They're almost always yeah. gonna, they're either finding an answer, they need a board wipe or so, or to kill something, or they're finding a way to win, probably. Yeah. Right? So, like, look at the information that you have available. Look at how much mana they have available, right? Do they have enough mana to cast what they're tutoring for? Or is that the only two mana that they've got left? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, have they missed a couple land drops? Maybe they're tutoring for a land. Yeah. You know, people do that Sad, on Ben you tutor do all the time, reason. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you hit your first two land drops thinking, oh, I'll draw a third one. Probably you miss your third land drop. You miss your fourth land drop and you draw a vampiric tutor and you're like, I just need to make this land drop. Yep. You know? Um, so you think about the actions that they've taken previous to that and say, given all that information, what do I think they're going to do? And like you say, call it out. Sometimes they'll be like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going for, you know, or you find out later in the game. And I would definitely raise them on my threat meter in those situations where they've tutored at a point where it, I'm pretty sure they didn't go get a setup card. Yeah. So it's very, it's unlikely that at this point in the game, they went and found something that creates more mana or something that draws them more cards. They probably found like an impactful card. And if they do have a combo in their deck, it's a very good chance that they found one of the pieces, probably the more key piece right. or the more or the piece that's more powerful sort of on its own. But very often, like, they can sort of get a two for one. Hey, I might combo in, I might draw into the rest of this combo, but mm -hmm. it'll be useful right now. Or I can sit here and wait on it and hope I draw the other piece or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I really do think most players out there are not even factoring in how many times their opponents have tutored as part of their threat assessment, though. Yeah, like, if, at all. If in the last three turns they've drawn six cards and tutored for two things, you're in trouble. I'm like, always counting, like, you've tutored three times now? Yep. Because if somebody tutors three times... They, you're going to lose to them. They just, they found their three best cards in their deck. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you need to let the, the rest of the table know uh, that that's going on so they can get ready too. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I think is uh, a signal that a, a, a combo may be coming and you need to be careful of this particular player is if they've self milled a lot. Yeah. There's easy, I don't know why I think a lot of players also sort of discount because it doesn't, it's not on the battlefield. It doesn't feel like anything's mm -hmm. happening, but man, if they have milled, 25 cards in, in their graveyards looking like that tall you're gonna die to them they've they've got stuff in there and they've yeah. got other stuff to get it back and they're gonna go into some kind of loop and they're gonna beat you and so assume most of the time that when people are doing things they're doing it intentionally yeah that they're working towards something and with self mill um like graveyard players out there know it's like having a second hand yeah it's, right. it's it's actually yeah that's a good point it's a similar to the player that's drawn 20 cards for sure if they milled 20 cards into their to their graveyard i would put that as like almost equivalent to having drawn 20 cards in the it's game. It's pretty close. Maybe yeah. not in every format, but definitely in Commander. Yeah. Um, another thing to watch out for or think about is, is their Commander part of a known combo? Mm. So if they've got Nimizit, if they've got, I don't know. They're, they're, we talked about Godo. Godo. Oh, primary boy. example. Godo actually tutors up the piece that needs to combo with, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if they're playing Godo, you've got to know from the beginning, almost no matter what happens, they're the they're the target. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're in huge trouble. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if their commander is part of a known combo that a lot of people run, that's why if they have a Rick Smith, these, you, you can ask about particular cards. niv right. can be like, oh, do you have curiosity, curiosity in there? Like, mm -hmm. there's certain cards you could know to ask about. Um, because that means they have to find less cards so mm -hmm. you know even if they haven't tutored if they've drawn even less cards they could still have the combo because they started with a combo piece or if you dealt with it it's coming back yes right so yep. you know if uh well if yeah they can yeah i think one of the things about sequencing combos is like 
we often try to like sneak out one of the combo pieces mm-hmm. because it's so much mana to play both in one turn. Well, if the commander is one of your combo pieces, it ve- feels very safe to try and sneak it out because if they're like, kill it, I didn't lose the combo piece. Whereas yeah. if you're like, part of my combo is food chain, and if I play that out there and they exile it or destroy it, I have a real hard time getting it back, then yeah. I have to hold that card until I'm about to go off. Yeah. Yeah, but if it's the commander, whatever, run it out for value in the early game, and it's there later if you want to combo with it. But if somebody deals with it, okay, just wait and cast it again later. Yeah, it just it sent me back a little because I got to pay two extra mana when I try and combo, right. but big deal. Yeah, yeah, it was worth a shot. Um, oh, there's uh, another little side note we put that... Is there a combo that t- is typically included in that uh, commander's deck, even if the commander's right. not part of that combo? That's something to think about as well. Yeah, and there's a, there's a bunch of these, um, especially once you get into higher power levels yeah. where you've got more generic commanders that are less involved in the deck. You know, they might just be a generic value engine in the command zone, um, but they run very typical combos. You might look at Thrasios decks and say infinite mana combos, right? right? So you might not know which infinite mana combo, but if you see somebody, you know, I don't know, a mystical tutor for dramatic reversal, you you got a pretty good indication, right? (laughs) They tutor for one half of it and you're like, okay, well, that's half of an infinite mana combo. You've got the infinite mana outlet in the command zone. I think I know what you're going for here. I think a combo right? is coming very, very yeah. soon. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, they can also do the Thoracle stuff too, so you got to watch out for it. Right. All. Yeah, draw myself out and win with that way. Um, and then I think the last, maybe not the last, but the last one we're going to talk about here is asking yourself the question of what type of player they are. And this is obviously... Uh, going to be more useful in playgroups or pods where you play with the same people over and over where again. you can get a sense of what they're like. Yeah. yeah. So, and listen, if we're playing with Cassius, Kyle Hill, mm-hmm. Post Malone, these are all people that play very powerful um, decks and they play, they, they don't have any problem like playing combo. They're not mm-hmm. CEH necessarily, mm-hmm. but their decks are near, they're, they're right in between casual and, and CEH. They're, yeah. These are people that are perfectly willing to tutor for their combo and went on the spot with yeah, it. Yeah, they're not pulling any punches. Yeah, there, yeah. which is fine. I, I don't mind because I know them and I know that's the type of game I'm in for when I'm with them. And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't even have to have the rule zero conversation anymore. If you sit down in a game with Posty, like bring good cards and yeah. good decks because he, he might combo off on you mm-hmm. on turn five. Um, so that can lead into it. Whereas if I'm in a game with... You know, a lot of people around here are more casual. Jimmy and I tend to skew more casually if we're not in games with, you know, mm-hmm. Cassius and, and the like. And so... You don't generally have to be worried that Jimmy's going to combo out on you on turn six or seven. It's just not a thing that he typically likes to do. Mm. Um, he, he's going to play around and like try and attack you a bunch and like yep. whatever, but he's not going to create infinite mana and attack sort you infinite times. More incremental as opposed to repetitive, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I have talked about, I literally tried to build my overall deck so it does not go infinite. And right. once I learned all the easy infinite lines, I took out that stuff so that I wouldn't. And that, again, nothing against combo people. I just didn't like that gameplay experience for myself. And I had a hard time doing it. But that is the type of players that we kind of are. And knowing yeah. that when you're sitting at the table means that you might be a little bit safer if I get near the 8, 9, 10 mana range yeah. than you would be against, you know. If well, Cassius is at 8 mana, y- yeah. every single turn he takes from here on to the rest of the game, he-, he will try and win if he can. Mm-hmm. Well, I seem to remember a Game Nights episode where, you know, yeah. with Samut, where he got off to a real quick start <laughs> yeah. and dropped a, uh, uh, an Ugin on three turn three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we learned about him from the very uh-huh, first time we met uh-huh. him. That was the first time we met him, by the way. <laughs> that was the first time we watched him and we were like, Cassius Marsh is one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing what type of player it is can help you lower them or raise them on the threat assessment as far as combo. And I think that is just important to keep um, top of mind. And also, like, you can ask the other opponents. This is a very similar thing to what we said at the end of the last uh, discussion, which is, you know, maybe you don't know them super well, but the other two opponents might have played with them right. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So you might be like, hey, are they likely to combo? Like, how scared am I supposed to be of what they're doing? Mm-hmm. And then you don't have to take their word for it, yeah. right? Because a lot of the time in the game, like you were saying, there's kind of a tension between like, I kind of want to win this game, but how much do I want to mislead them? Or how right. carefully do I want to word this answer? Do I want to bold face lie to win this yeah. game? Yeah. Generally, that's going to hurt you more than it's going to help you in the long run. Or if somebody's like, do you play Freed from the Real? And you're like, no, I don't because I play Pemanzora. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I said. <laughs> I checked with my lawyers and they said I'm allowed to say no. (laughs) All right. So you've threat assessed. You've identified the combo. It's coming. How do you stop it? 
Ooh, this is a good question. I mean, and it's very hard in a general sense to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Threat assessment in general is kind of tough to talk about just because there's so much stuff that goes on in a game and, and more than in two player formats, right? There's just four times the amount of stuff, or I guess two times the amount of stuff. But it's exponential because yeah. of the way that sort of magic effects kind of stack on top of each other. Yeah, because yeah. you don't have to, you don't just have to worry about one opponent. You have to worry about one opponent and how their stuff interacts with somebody else's stuff yes. and it interacts with your stuff, right? So in general, it's a pretty tough um, conversation to have, but there are some sort of broad strokes good ideas so if they if your spidey sense is going off if you've got alarm bells or sirens going off in your brain the first thing you do is find an answer right if you have the capability to tutor for something or to draw some more cards just see more cards right you got a sensei's divining top out spin the top see what's on top you know yeah you might find a path to exile or whatever that'll just you know get rid of that thing and now you don't have to worry about the combo yeah take stock of what you've got available to you and see if you can sort of funnel that into an answer yeah. Right. Like you said, sometimes it comes from uh, places that you don't expect it. Sometimes it's a magical hack to change your karmic guide right. to protection from white. Right. Just take stock of how your resources, everything you have access to right now could go into stopping something from happening. Yeah. I think a lot of players don't turn into like, I need to be digging through my deck like quite mm -hmm. early enough. And uh, you can tell good players because pretty early they'll just start doing stuff. And it's like yeah. they're spending resources literally to just try and look through as much of their deck as possible because they know they're about to die. Yeah. And like if I don't kill that thing, I pr like doubling season got cast and then they said go. And it's like, okay, this is an emergency situation. Yes. If they untap with that doubling season, we're almost all certainly dead because that player would never cast doubling season unless they also had the follow-up play. Right. So right. now I'm in a situation where like I got to kill that. And if I don't have it, I got to do everything I can to find it. Otherwise we lose, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it can be kind of tough because a lot of people love playing expensive interaction. Like expensive interaction is really flashy. Like if you look at uh, what's the mana drain that makes treasures instead of gives you mana. Spell Swindle. Spell Swindle. That's yeah. the one, right? It's five hard, mana counter It's counterspell. hard to leave up five mana. It's yeah. a five mana counter spell, right? Yeah. Like who's got five mana? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like if you've got five mana on your turn, you, you want to do something. You know, um, well, and I'm, not, and I'm not saying you don't get play punished hard if you hold it in your hand right. and they don't cast anything that's at least five mana. Right. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, one of the things that I do in my decks is uh, I tend to run cheaper interaction, even if it's a little bit more narrow. Um, things this like is a hallmark of CDH, by the way. Yeah, right. Like CDH, you'll find it, it'll play things like. I don't know what's a good example. Chain of Vapor. Or mental, claim, mental misstep, mental misstep is a dispel. big one, right? Dispel. These are things that have like restrictions on what they can target. But what do you, what do you think about Washout? What does Washout do? Washout's the cleave one mana counter commander spell counter, a spell that wasn't cast from their hand and then three mana counter anything. What does cleave do? The cleave is it allows you to counter <laughs> anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. It's, it's. Is that um, a CDH able card? I don't know if it's CDH. One thing that was recent Too narrow. Is, uh, Mystical Dispute was a good one. It's the one, it's a three mana counter spell, but it costs two less if it targets a blue spell. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that card's really oh, cool. Oh, because Red Elemental Blast I play in like almost every deck. Yeah, so, yeah right? Yeah. Like nine times out of 10, when you were looking to counter something, it's blue. It's it's like somebody's trying to counter your stuff and this is a one mana counter spell for that, right? To so you see stuff. how he's um, prioritizing the mana cost above utility almost which yeah. is not something we do as much in casual but i think one way to stop combo is to have the answer at the right moment and you're yes. much more likely to be able to deploy the answer at the right moment if it costs less because you can hold chain of vapor up mm -hmm. and still do stuff on your turn yeah whereas if spell swindle is your answer then you really 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 have to know that it's going to happen for sure because you're risking your entire turn by holding up the mana to right. stop it where it's l way r less risky to be like okay i got seven mana i'm gonna use six of it and hold up my answer and now i'm reasonably assured that like we're not just going to die right like now yeah. of course they can have their own counters and they can set up but mm -hmm. that usually takes a uh, you know, now they have to have tutored and also have these answers in their hand. They just need another piece. Yeah. So if you're frequently ending the game with a card in hand that you weren't able to cast that would have stopped the game from ending, this is maybe something you want to think about. Either you're being a little bit too aggressive on, on uh, pushing your own uh, game plan at the expense of being able to interact with somebody else's. So it, maybe it's a, it's a gameplay thing that you have to adjust. Or if you're looking to bump the power level up on your deck to match your pod, I wouldn't say don't, don't go too far past your pod, but if it's something that you want to do to bump up your power level to match your pod, then reducing the average converted mana cost of your interaction is a great way to do that. Yeah, so cheap answers would make it more likely that you'll have the answer. Mm -hmm. um, another way to stop a combo 
is to recruit help. We talk, we keep talking about every section has had a, Hey, talk to people yeah. answer. And this is a good one, right? Which is just point out that this is a problem and they should be scared of it. Right. Cause not everybody knows when I said that Teferi, uh, when I saw the Teferi and the vampiric tutor, the other two players in the game were not aware that that was an issue. They didn't, mm -hmm. one of the players was like, what's knowledge pool. Yep. And I was like, Oh, if they get that out, we don't cast any spells anymore mm -hmm. and only Shauna cast spells from the rest of the game. And they're like, Oh, that's bad. Yeah, that's we don't want that to happen. Yeah. And I was like, right. And so they're like, okay, cool. And then they could adjust in their thinking and the way like, Previous to that, they were going to do something different on their turn, and then they were like, okay, cool. I will be ready for that. Yeah, and so you've got more resources that, that are helping you stop the game from ending. Yeah, it's just a, two more players that can find an answer if you don't have one. Yeah. Or also can answer it even if you have the answer, you know? So I love doing this. <laughs> this this actually, this is one of the things that happens. People uh, like to say quite frequently that uh, politics doesn't happen a lot in CDH. Right. This specific thing happens a ton. Yeah, it's who's going to blink first because you don't want to use your resources. The uh, There's a term for it. It's called priority bullying. Yeah. And it's a situation where the person who's last to act in priority order is generally in the worst situation. Because if they say no, it happens. Yeah. So if I'm Boy, first, you really got to be aware that oh, they've got it, though, if you yeah. pass it to them. If I'm first to act, rather than saying that I've got interaction that's appropriate for this, I'm asking people if they've got interaction. So if, you know, food chain comes down and I'm like, I've got a swan song in my hand or yeah. whatever, and I'm going to counter this food chain. Um, I'm saying, does anybody have anything for this food chain? Right. I'm first to act. I don't have to give up any yeah. information. Right. Yeah. And then if somebody else has something for it, they say, well, I can counter it. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to pass priority. Oh, great. Because oh, great, I didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how that kind of lying is yeah. fine because yeah. you never have to show it. Where oh, yeah. I ask somebody if they have a knowledge pool in their deck, it's not okay for them to say no if the answer is yes. Yep. Oh. It Listen, also human interaction is just, you know, that's just the, there's a lot of gray areas. It also makes for some really dramatic moments if that person counters it. And then the person who casts the food chain maybe counters their counter spell. And you're like, haha, I've got a counter spell for that. And then people didn't expect it because you passed priority initially. Has there ever been a move where like the last person in line has like an activated ability on something and can reset priority? So they go, listen, I know you did, you're bullying me because you think I, but I don't. So I'm going to tap this and give you a chance to use the answer I know you've got. Yeah. Long, long <laughs> answer. Yes. But it also goes both ways <laughs> because I could potentially say I'm going to pass priority and then force you to activate an ability to reset priority order so that the game doesn't end. Wow complicated yeah it's uh <laughs> it's maybe a little too complicated but uh but the moral of that it, story yeah. is you can recruit help although sometimes yes. that help will be uh hesitant shall we mm -hmm, say mm -hmm. uh, another thing and this is harder to pull off you have to have a little bit of acting skills and you can't overdo it otherwise people will catch on to it but you can bluff mm -hmm. that you have interaction and i've seen this work a lot um you just hold up mana and then you kind of posture like you're not worried um, don't go overboard. A lot of people are like, I'm not worried about that. You don't have mm -hmm. to say things necessarily. But I've definitely seen a lot of combos stopped by just the fact that somebody might interact with it. You know what I do all the time? This is my pro gamer move, okay? Take notes at home. Okay. Um, if you've got your mana set up, your land set up, and they're sort of in stacks yeah, in front of you. separate the right? two off. Separate the, the two off. The two blue. It's Wait classic. until somebody's about to start doing something, then stack two blue and move it off to the yeah. side and don't say anything. <laughs> right. Just do it. People notice that stuff, right? <laughs> For sure. That's one of my favorites of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In that same game where the fairy knowledge pool thing was happening, there mm -hmm. was a turn earlier in that game where a player's like, you could tell, looked at, you know, another player and looked at the mana they had and kind of sighed and did something. And so it was clearly mm -hmm. like, mm, I can't risk the play I really want to make because I don't want that to get stopped. So who knows? I don't know if that was going to be a game winning play, but people are definitely paying attention to how much mana their opponents have available to them and what they might do with it, how far they want to stick their neck out. Another favorite of mine is asking people questions. Yeah. So you can say, even if you don't want to explicitly draw attention to something, this kind of plays into the last, uh, the last uh, example, which is recruiting help. But if you want to point to something and say this is a problem you can say what do you got going on over there and have them explain it yeah right? same thing uh when you're talking about bluffing you could say if you wanted to bluff that you have a fluster storm in your hand yeah. right you could say what's the storm count at yeah right <laughs> it's just it, little stuff like that that yep. makes people sort of second guess and then they're why are thinking, you asking me that then they're thinking why what like what has he got in his hand that cares about storm count right yeah. and so sometimes we we just meme about it and say you know what's your devotion to blue over there but uh <laughs> asking somebody a question can you know make them think twice about what they've got uh, you had an interesting turn of phrase here that I really, really liked that you called interaction deadlines. Yeah. So do you want to explain 
this thought process. I think I have a similar thought process, but I never gave it a name before. So mm-hmm. first of all, good marketing. <laughs> and secondly, yeah, what is interaction deadlines? So uh, this kind of plays into what we were talking about earlier when it uh, when we were talking about sequencing combos and the best time to act, right? So an interaction deadline, say you've got a piece of interaction, you've got a sword supply of shares in your hand, right? You're looking at the board and you say, yeah, there really aren't any juicy targets. Maybe it's a bunch of mana dorks. I don't want to sword as a mana dork, right? So I'm going to say in my head, mentally, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to use this when something big comes up, right? Some, something big is attacking me. Or I might even say when something big comes down, but you also don't want to swords the creature the second it comes into play if it's not going to affect you, right? Because right. if, if my opponent right in front of me is going to be attacking the person to my side... Then you're actually taking out something that's on your side. Yeah, it's advancing your game <laughs> yeah. too, because they're my opponent as well. So I don't want to blow that interaction because interaction is really valuable in commander i don't want to blow that before i absolutely have to and like we were talking about before more options and more information is more power so when we've got interaction in our hand we want to say okay what what is that line in the sand and then with every new piece of information that we get we're revising that deadline so um you know, if if I've got that swords and a creature comes down and say, that's kind of a big, but we'll wait to see what happens with it. If you see a combo piece come down, then think about what the combo is, how it works, and what is the last possible moment that I could interact to make best use of that piece of interaction. Yeah, I actually think I look at my interaction as uh, a little game of like, how long can I wait to use this? Yep. I don't actually even look for juicy targets. I'm mm-hmm. literally like, if I can make it to the end of this game and win without using it, I, I did a good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I have to use it, it's because I have to use it. Mm-hmm. I really don't want to use it unless it's absolutely necessary. Because what you find, and if you think back to a lot of games that you've lost, I guarantee this has happened. Something occurred near the end and you really are like, I wish I had that removal spell that I used on that other thing earlier. And that other thing yeah. was bad, but... But it, it didn't end the game. It wasn't going to win the game. Yeah. And th- and if I just would have had it a turn later still, that, sure, player C would be ahead in the game because I didn't destroy their thing, mm-hmm. but I'd probably still be alive and have a chance. Exactly. Whereas we just lost because I didn't have that thing anymore and I used it on a juicy target, but not a necessary target. Yeah. Yeah. So, so having an intimate knowledge of how the combo works, the mechanics and the, the steps involved allows you to make a really accurate assessment of when to use that interaction it puts a good deadline on it um we're going to talk about maximizing the disadvantage here in a second because that's our last point but yeah. real quickly i wanted to take an aside and we had discussed um before recording about countering tutors mm-hmm. specifically and there's a general uh conventional wisdom out there which states that you should counter not the tutor itself but what they tutored for yeah and this is something that jimmy and i have talked about on the show before and you actually think that that's not true all the time yeah there's some situations where uh, because the the general knowledge behind that is that it's a two for one right right? so um you let them get the thing you counter the thing you counter the tutor and the thing exactly yeah because they got no benefit out of it Mm -hmm. right Their, their transaction was not fruitful right but a lot of decks in EDH, like we mentioned before, especially with graveyards, they treat them like a second hand. So tutoring a card, unless you're, unless you're or sorry, countering a, a card, unless it's countering it to exile, like something like summary dismissal or mind sure. break trap or but whatever. But all those are expensive. Yeah. Um, but th- unless it's putting it in exile, it's putting it in the graveyard. Right. And if you're playing against a graveyard deck, that makes it relatively accessible for them. So, you know, if somebody, if I'm, if I'm predicting what somebody's going to get, if I'm saying, you know what, there's a lot of artifacts on the board, I think that they're tutoring for a Dockside Extortionist, right? I don't think I want that Dockside Extortionist to go to the graveyard if they're playing black. Right. Right. Because then they're just going to be able to reanimate it. And now the Dockside's back in play. Right. And I mean, a lot of the combos with Dockside involve sacking it and then exactly. reanimating it anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So countering the tutor in that situation leaves it in their library and makes it less accessible for them to use later. Right. They might get the tutor back, but then it's still two steps away at the very least. Exactly. You're gonna, it's going to be more telegraphed. Yep. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, and, and these days, especially, I think that there's almost no decks you run into that don't interact with their graveyard in some way. Every Especially green deck's going to have a regrowth or an eternal witness. Valigate like recovery. Valigate recovery is just in every green deck now. Yeah. Um, all the blue decks are going to have, you know, Ar- Archaeomancer or maybe a Snapcaster or something like that. Yeah, or like Echo of Eons tosses yeah. it back in the library. Even. White's all got all these regrowth things now too that are like, for, especially for low CMC stuff. Mm-hmm. But people are onto the fact that like, I'm going to have key things in my... Uh, 
in my deck and if they get thwarted in some way i want to be able to have another shot at it right and and also just the fact that like as the game goes on the lab the graveyard gets bigger and bigger and mm -hmm. so anything that gets anything out of your graveyard is closer to tutoring than drawing a card because you're choosing from from a lot of different things yeah. right options yeah so I, I i like that a lot think about the deck that you're playing against especially if it's creature recursion based then mm -hmm. you do not want to wait till the tutor resolves yep bingo Okay, let's talk about maximizing the disadvantage. So you you mentioned a second ago about like thinking when's the last possible instant I can deploy uh, my interaction to a have the most information mm -hmm. so that I know for sure as much as I'm going to know about what's happening. But I think also we want to make sure that when we do stop a combo, we hurt the combo player the most possible. Yeah, we set them back the most amount. Yep. So it is choosing the right target at the right moment so that you make it as hard as possible for them to recover from this stumbling block that you've just thrown at yep. them. Yep. Yeah. But it also buys you a little bit more time to deal with it, right? Because a lot of the time when you stop a combo, you're not doing it in a really final way. Yeah. It's you're like, saying, oh. like you're kicking the can down the road here, you know? Yeah. So when you do have the answer, sort of having a general concept of how combos work will allow you not only to stop it, but leave them in the worst possible position. I have a couple of examples here and let, I wanted to talk through like where you would deploy, mm -hmm. you know, where in the process. So let's say it's Kiki Jiki, mm -hmm. it's Kiki Jiki deck. They got Kiki Jiki out. They play zealous conscripts. Yep. At, you have a path to exile in your hand. Mm -hmm. At what point in here do you deploy the path to exile? Is it with zealous conscripts on the stack? Do you let ze zealous conscripts con conscripts resolve and then target something, usually an opponent's creature with the first trigger, and wait for Kiki Jiki to activate, targeting the zealous conscripts? So you kill zealous then. Do you wait for the first token? I don't know why you would, but maybe to be yeah yeah. At what point in there? There's a lot of choices. Do you target? Kiki Jiki or Zealous Conscript. So Which one? Yeah. yeah, you can actually look at it like a decision tree, right? So you can say, you know, there's a, a certain opportunities that you get to interact, yep. right? So in this situation, if we assume that Kiki Jiki's in play, we're casting Zealous Conscripts and Zealous Conscripts, the spell is on the stack, right? At this point, um, if you remove the Kiki Jiki, then uh, they won't be able to activate it at all. Right. right. The, the Zealous Conscript is going to come into play. They might get some value out of it. They're going to steal a creature, but that's it. Yeah. yeah. So that's a pretty good situation to be in. They're still going to get a creature out of it. If you allow the spell to resolve, then the Zealous Conscript enters the battlefield. You get priority again with the trigger on the stack. They've already selected their target for it. They're going to pick Kiki Jiki to untap it. Right. So in this situation, the um, trigger is going to resolve either way. Oh, sorry, it's not going to resolve if you remove the Kiki Jiki because right. there won't be anything to untap. But you could remove the Zealous Conscripts and still have the Kiki Jiki untapped. That's not a great situation to be in. Who right? knows what their follow up play is or that's, what else has got on board? Yeah, that's probably worse than the first scenario, right? right? In that they've still got the Kiki Jiki. Now it's untapped for some reason. I would want to let them do that. Um, you could, with the trigger on the stack to untap the Kiki Jiki, remove the Kiki Jiki. Then they've got the Zealous Conscripts in play and they didn't get anything out of it because the trigger will not resolve because it doesn't have a valid target. Right. I mean, their first trigger is going to be somebody else's creature and then they're going to activate Kiki, right? Uh, usually it's... Uh, yeah. Because yeah, there's yeah. no reason for the first trigger from Zealous yeah. to... Act. So it's uh, so in that situation, now they've just got Zealous Conscripts in play, right? They Yeah, and like you said, they might, uh, they might pull an opponent's creature or something like that. Um, if you let it enter the battlefield and let the trigger resolve... Say they've got an opponent's creature in play, they're going to activate Kiki Jiki targeting Zealous Conscripts, right? That's the next step in the combo. Yep. Uh, in that situation, you could remove the Zealous Conscripts. The Kiki Jiki, tr Kiki Jiki trigger will not resolve. It'll be tapped. That's probably your optimal point to, to interact at this point because in this situation, they really they don't have the Zealous Conscripts anymore. The Kiki Jiki is tapped, so they can't make another copy of something. And that's better than the previous scenarios that we uh, talked about in general terms. Depending Especially on what if Kiki is their commander, because you'd really prefer to exile Zealous Conscripts. Because if you yes. leave them with Zealous Conscripts on the battlefield, but no Kiki, they can they can solve that situation by just casting, casting Kiki, Kiki again. again. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, you've really kicked the can very little down the road if you remove Kiki, which is what you have to do if Zealous Conscripts is on the stack. Yeah. Um, um, although I will say there are some other arguments. What if there's a blue player that you suspect might have a counter, but is, um, but is, uh, what'd you call it? Priority bullying. You. Priority bullying. Yeah. Or trying to bait out your interaction. Well, and then uh, there's always the, the possibility that they have an answer for your initial interaction. Mm -hmm. So if you, if zealous is on the stack 
and you use sword splash shares on Kiki and they do something that stops your, mm -hmm. gives it protection from whatever, or, you know, maybe they're in blue too and they counter your swords. With Zealous on the stack, the blue player still has a chance to now go, okay, fine, I'm going to step in here and counter yep. the Zealous conscripts. In that situation, I would probably be a little bit more vocal. Like we were talking about before in yeah. recruiting, uh, you know, allies. In that situation, I'm going to bluff that I have no interaction because my deadline is later than theirs. Yes. Right? So the counterspell player, if, unless it's like a, a tail's end, tail's end, uh, or a stifle or a trick bind or something like that. Right. If it's like spell counter magic, uh, their deadline is the zealous conscript is still on the stack. That's when they have to interact when they get priority. So I'm going to say, if anybody's got a counter spell, like I got nothing, you know? Yeah. And pass. Um, force their hand on that one. Right. Yeah. I don't ever want to be in a situation where I've like passed. So yeah. that actually makes you more likely to wait yeah. until because yeah, it's may as well make them use their Yeah, you definitely want to wait as long as possible. In that situation, I would probably be the bully. <laughs> okay, let's do another scenario. That was fun. Okay. Okay. Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood. Um, this is the combo where one of them says, uh, whenever you gain life, opponents lose that much life. Mm -hmm. And then that's Sanguine Bond. And then Exquisite Blood says, whenever an opponent loses life, you gain that life. Mm -hmm. So with both of them out, if you deal any damage to an opponent, it'll start this loop where you they all die. Yeah. Um, so you, let's say you have a Chaos Warp in your hand. Yep. And let's say they put Exquisite Blood on the stack. They've already got Sanguine Bond out. Okay. Yeah, so in that situation, again, we, we kind of look at this as a decision tree. We say first opportunity to, to act is with the spell on the stack, Yeah. right? This is like probably a pretty good situation um, to interact if we've got a chaos warp. Uh, if we chaos warp the one that's in play, the other one is going to come into, into play and essentially do nothing. Right. Right. I will say that Sanguine Bond is an effect. There are a lot of stand-ins for They could have a True. veto. They could they have a, a Dina. Not veto. V veto. Not like veto like the president does, but V-I-T-O. You know what I'm right. saying. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a, there's a guild mage that I think does this. Yep. Uh, uh, Viscopa maybe. Viscopa guild mage. Yeah. yeah. So Exquisite Blood is the effect that they don't reprint on any cards yeah. for this reason. Um, they don't want any redundancy for it. Mm -hmm. So like it, it is unique to its effect. Yeah. And that's a fair point, right? Like if you can say taking out this one piece at this opportunity by waiting or, yeah. or which I forgot which one we had on the battlefield. Uh, Sanguine Bond. Sanguine Bond. Blood on the on the yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if we can take out the, the key piece that sort of layers with all of the other pieces that might be in the deck for, as a redundancy, then you want to take away the rarer one or the one that's harder to come by. But having them, letting them both land is dangerous. It is dangerous. Yeah. I mean, you can still, so it depends on what else they have in play if they're going to rely on attacking then you got to look at okay who's open how likely are we to actually lose life right maybe they've got a tim in play where they can just say okay well i'll deal damage to you right that's probably bad news right because right. then there's there's a lot less agency involved in um in you can see it there i mean you could wait yeah. till they activate the tim then try and get rid of the explosive blood but if they have anything else yeah then they go oh uh, haha lightning bolt and then right. yeah yeah so it, it depends on how they're going to trigger it initially and of course that might push your deadline back a little bit you might say oh, i have a little bit more time until we find out how they're actually going to deal the damage uh, but in general having all of the pieces to a combo in play is bad news this one's a little bit different because they're triggers yeah but uh, I would say that, it, you know, in other combo examples, if they're instant speed, then you're you're in danger zone if everything's in play. Because you might go to interact, you might chaos warp, and then they can continue the combo yeah. in response. on top of it. Right? Like they just, so like you say. Yeah, it's like, oh, great. Your chaos warp's going to resolve after everybody's dead, so it won't right. matter. Yeah. Yeah, I think in this case, I would just get rid of the Sanguine Bond and just what with Exquisite Blood on the stack and yeah. just be like, yep, v Vito or Viscopo Guildmage may come down, but it's... It's not going to be this turn because they would have to yeah. have like 20 mana to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'll just live to fight another day. And yep. like if next turn they play Vito, then I'll deal with it then. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Or start talking to your opponents too and say like, uh, I, I can deal with this now. But if this happens again, like there are other things that can do this. If this happens again, you know, you guys got to have my back on this one too. Yeah. When we're done here, Exquisite Blood will still be on the battlefield. Right. So please don't just tap out on your turn. Save yeah. your interaction for if this person tries to combo. Yeah. Fight's not over. Yeah. That's that's nice. Okay, let's talk about um, the the flip side of all of this. Mm -hmm. So now, up till now, we've mostly been talking about it as if we're not the combo player and we're playing against them. Mm -hmm. But that's not the, always the case. Sometimes you are the Cassius Marsh. Sometimes you are the Post Malone. Yep. Sometimes you are Kyle Hill. Sometimes you have really cool hair. I don't, but he does. Executing your combo is the next category. On the, I, I guess, 
we're going to talk about here how you correctly play your combo so that it does not get stopped in the ways we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So let's walk through some ways we can kind of sneak our combo in, guarantee ourselves a victory, mm -hmm. or snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Um, the first one we have written down is pick your spot. So are your opponents tapped out? Tapped out is a great place to be if you're yep. with your opponents being tapped out. Great place to be if you're a combo player. Is there has their attention been elsewhere? A lot mm -hmm. of games end this way, right? Where mm -hmm. like somebody's the gets off to a fast start, they're scary, 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 and then this player in the corner just kind of sneaks in there yep. for the win at a point. Or you've got two players that are just wailing on each other all game. There you got a bit of a grudge match situation. Yep. You're like, okay, well, if I'm going to fly under the radar, this is the way to go. Yeah, right? I'll just uh, develop my board and then yep. uh, no. Oh, they used all their stuff. I, I I think also like decks only have so much interaction. Yep. So I feel. A lot safer after a few pieces of interaction have already been used yes uh there's just less likely that they've got it so sometimes even if they have some open mana you can feel safer like hey what did, are they really going to draw path swords and this other thing all so far in the game when only 12 total cards have been drawn or if there's a counter spell war going on yeah. where you know counter 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 if you've got an instant speed way to do something at that situation even with the counter spells on the stack you yeah. can do it in response and say hey this is something i've been looking to do for a while and i've just been waiting for a good opportunity to do it in cdh that's ad nauseum most of the time it's right counter war and then they're like sneaking ad nauseum on yeah top ad nauseum well Once you guys don't have any more counters left yeah. i know that oh sad for you <laughs> <laughs> that's cool uh proper sequencing is really important when trying to execute your combo um deploy your pieces carefully and in the proper order so as not mm -hmm. to show your hand or spook your opponents i think also being aware of which pieces of the combo you have more redundancy for yep. and which ones you don't so in the sanguine bond exquisite blood thing of course sanguine bond would be on the table before exquisite blood mm -hmm. because sanguine bond by itself is actually not as scary right because Again, there's only one other card in the deck that really combos with that. Whereas if mm -hmm. Exquisite Blood gets played first, there might be four or five cards in their deck that combos with that. Yep. Yeah. So um, if Astronaut's Altar is a key piece, Phyrexian Altar probably also is. Maybe Altar Dimension, it, Dimension is. Maybe Goblin Bombardment is. So mm -hmm. that's why I think Ash Astronaut's is particularly difficult. Yeah. Uh, because it is a piece that is fairly cheap. And when they slide it out there on an early turn, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to combo. Yeah. Uh, usually. There are fair applications for Ad Astronaut's Altar sometimes uh, but for the most part you're like okay well it's coming it's yeah. coming somewhere down the line i don't know when but it's but hard it's because it's not going to come necessarily right away yeah. they feel way more safe casting it and then just sort of using it as a value piece for a while before they combo out yeah it has utility outside of the combo that, yeah. that's a real hallmark of good combos is when the pieces aren't dead by themselves yeah right yeah the, yeah because if they're dead by themselves then you just don't play it until the moment you're going to combo off yeah. food chain right you just never see a food chain come down and they don't combo off because it's so important important to what everything they're doing they're just going to hold it until that moment yep. it's like treasonous ogre nobody just plays treasonous ogre and then it's like go like hey i'll pay life for mana later like yeah, or you're gonna be like i'm gonna play treasonous ogre and then pay three life make one mana and faithless looting yeah that's not happening nobody ever does that it's just wait <laughs> until it's going to do the yep. full part of it so but so, so don't be the person that's playing the Trees of Ogre thinking that you're going to get away with it yeah. because people know what those cards are. And so you play the less threatening pieces first, the, the ones that have more utility that just could be innocuous, innocuously used. Yeah, really. Just assume that anybody you're playing against was watching this episode of the Command Zone and saying, I know how to, how to spot this combo from a mile away. Yeah. Give them as few signals as possible. Uh, I also put employ decoys. So I think a good strategy can be to prevent uh or sorry to present a threat that's not part of your combo but is something that is scary enough that opponents will have to focus and deal with yeah. it and use their interaction on that thing mm -hmm. especially if that thing is an enchantment a, a hard to remove type of card and they're not likely to have a lot of cards in their deck that can remove that type of card so a creature is less effective at this uh than an enchantment if you have an enchantment piece of your combo mm -hmm. what that does is it screws up people's deadlines right uh one uh thing that you'll see sometimes people play is uh either grand abolisher or silence because that pushes people's deadlines up to this second right now yeah if this hits the battlefield or if this resolves you're done that's it yeah. the game's over right so people have to use their counter magic on it. it it's like you say it's it's not even like it's a big threat by itself but if they don't use their their interaction right now they're not going to get an opportunity to yeah the implied is that whatever my follow-up play is it's going to knock you out exactly yeah i like that a lot um, um, I also think something people don't do enough, and I just came up with this point, it's not, there's no fancy copy for it, but is consider which deck at the table is 
the worst for your deck um the most likely to be able yeah. to stop your combo yep. a lot of times you'll be at a deck and let's say i have an enchantment based uh combo piece or something that's going on well the green and the white players are way more likely to have interaction for what you're doing so if you are in a game and you can pressure that player specifically pl pressure their life total early mm -hmm. you can cause them to have to make moves that they don't have to make and t and dwindle their resources yeah so that later in the game you can deploy your combo and you know like they had to s they, you know, they had to kill a creature earlier than they wanted to. They had to play out some blockers when maybe they would want to set up in a different way. And you've, and you've sort of nerfed them to the point where like, okay, and now they're not ready. And I'm going to attack them from this new angle of a combo. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and then assess the assessment. So are they, or have they been actively worried about you? This can be overt or covert, and I, I think covert means they're eyeing your board. Yeah. And you can catch people eyeing your board a lot. Yep. And if they're eyeing your board, that person has threat assessed you as the problem. Yep, 100%. They're, they're like, can I see your graveyard over yeah. there? Or can I, uh, you know, how much land you got untapped, right? These are the questions that people ask yeah. when they're assessing your board. The, the real sly ones will try not to ask you any questions, but then they will still have to know how much land you had. So they have to count it. So you can see them like looking at your board and sort of maybe lips are even moving and they keep glancing back because they're trying to be sly. So if they go like, look, then look again, then look a third time. Listen, they've identified you as the threat. And then what that means to you, I think is like, you can't go for your combo right now mm -hmm. because they know they're waiting. They're, they're ready for it. You yep. sort of have to wait. They are like, all right, you got eight mana. I know the type of player you are. That thing is scary. Yep. And now they are definitely going to try and hit you at the worst part to maximize the disadvantage when you try to go for the combo. I uh, did this once. Actually, this is kind of like employing decoys, but a combo of assessing the assessment and, and employing decoys. I saw somebody, um, an opponent of mine, he was playing an Azorius deck and had an Avacyn Angel of Hope in play. Everything and it was indestructible. Yeah, it was, it was causing us a lot of problems, right? And I've got a Necromancy in my hand. Three mana enchantment reanimates something. Yep. Um, I said to my other opponent, the non Azorius player, graveyard player, I said, can I see your graveyard? And he says, yeah, he hands it over to me. I sort of riffle through it a little bit, pull out the Avenger of Zendikar that's in his graveyard. I didn't really want an Avenger yeah. of Zendikar. I sort of pulled it out a little bit and handed it back to him, right? You like put it on top of the graveyard. In fact, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I was like, uh, here you go. And and uh, the Azorius player says, what, what do you got going on over there? He says, oh, I have an Avenger of Zendikar in my graveyard. I said, okay. So I said, I'm going to cast Necromancy. And he says, what are you targeting? And I said, I don't have to tell you yet because it's an enchantment. It ETBs, yeah. so then I choose a target. So I need to know whether it resolves. And he says, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's, it, it resolves. What are, what are you picking? You take your Avengers and a car. I said, I'm going to take the Gilded Drake in your graveyard and take your Avacyn. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, I'm going to force a will your necromancy. I'm like, oh, we're far. Too late. That. I already yeah, asked you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you don't have kinda, to tell you. Yeah. You can kind of throw people off with subtle clues like that, right? That's if nice. you know that they're watching. That's great. Um, yeah. So be it, be attentive to the fact that like, if they are aware of what, you know, you being the threat or what you might do, you might be able to throw some false signals in there. I like mm -hmm. that a lot. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for joining us. That was very fun. Thanks for having me. Uh, that is the extent of our combo, combo combos today. Combo combos, combo combos. We can say it to the listeners. What are your favorite combos in commander? What are your cool bluffing stories? Like the one that Jim just told. Uh, do you like combos in Commander? Do you hate them? Uh, you know, I guess we can hear from those people too. They'll tell us regardless. But seriously, I, I, if there are any like cool combo stories you've got, I'd love to see it in the comments. It's always fun to hear that stuff. Before you go, make sure that you go to channelfireball.com slash command to order all of your magic par cards, products, singles. I said parts because that's products and cards. Uh, you know, We've got Crimson Vow is out now. Mm -hmm. Kamigawa, Neon Dynasty, right on the horizon. It is the holidays. You are probably thinking of what you want to get your friends and family for the holidays. Magic cards are a great holiday gift. Channelfirewall.com slash command is the place to go to get all that stuff, especially if you want to make sure you're going to get it pretty quickly because all these vendors are sending stuff out super fast. I've been impressed with all, every time I've used the marketplace, it's been really, really good. Um, and then once you get those cards, Ultra Pro is the way to protect them. Or Ultra Pro products make great gifts as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know you have a friend that plays a certain deck and there is a playmat, deck boxes, sleeves, even sometimes there are binders that have the image of that deck. Like if they've built a new Olivia deck, there is a really cool like showcase art deck box for mm -hmm. the Olivia. Like giving them all the stuff to dress their deck up real nice. Like, yeah, I think that would be a sweet gift. I wish somebody would do that for me. I don't know if I have, is there Orvar sleeves and stuff? Because if there was... 
I mean, Jimmy, just a little hint. Okay. Um, special thanks. Oh, no. Now it's time for the instep. Oh, gosh. We have Jim here. Now it's time for the instep where we Dude. talk about something cool outside the world of magic. This is great because I don't have to come up with an instep. Jim. All right. Do you have oh, something wait. cool to talk I gotta, about? I got to do something first here. Oh. Yes. Well, okay. that was, he'll get better with practice. We'll practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So something cool outside the world of magic. Yeah. Um, I, I, something that maybe some people know about me is that I'm a huge Legend of Zelda fan. Love uh, it, love it, love it. Everything about it. And it's Zelda's uh, 35th anniversary this cow. year. It makes me feel old. Of the original. Wow. For Nintendo. I'm 35 years old as well. Uh, one of the coolest well, you things. you were born the same year that yeah, Legend of Zelda came out? Yeah. That makes me feel old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the cool things that they're doing for the 35th anniversary is they've released a handheld Game & Watch game that has uh, the original Legend of Zelda Zelda 2, which not a lot of people have played because the game is not good. Um, Should we and, throw the sword a little ways? Yeah. Like that far? It's hard. It's like, very hard. It's very hard. And uh, Link's Awakening. Which wow. Was, yeah. All on a watch now? On, on, it's, it's like a handheld game. You know the things that you used to buy at like a grocery store? And oh, like a yeah, video yeah, game? It's one of those. Oh, that's cool. Um, but it's got all three games loaded on it. Ooh, um, because, this is a holiday gift as well. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, if any of you out there are shopping for me for Christmas, this is what I want. Um, it's, yeah, it's really, really cool. I, I don't know. It's just sort of a piece of Zelda history. I think it's a super appropriate thing for the 35th anniversary, um, you know, along with maybe some ports for Switch that actually work. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no shade well does maybe this, a little bit um shade. does this device have all the bugs of the original games i don't think so mm, that's too bad are you talking about the like zelda 2 thing where you can kind of cheese the final battle against shadow link well there's all kinds of little bugs like, but that's one of them that's yeah. one of them where you can yeah. just sort of need you can like and, skip certain levels in the yeah. original by like going like oh yeah, yeah. you know yeah, like, yeah, yeah yeah you can like go back and forth a couple times uh, i, I forget know. all this but there maybe i'll try it <laughs> i'll do a playthrough i don't know if you can hook it up to twitch so that i can stream it but i'm sure you can like, you can do it off tv it's a game and watch yeah, there's oh that's interesting it, so I don't it wouldn't it be like a port of anything. any kind no just well maybe just you just lock it down somehow and then you get a camera and just point it at it It'd probably be fine i could do that i'll yeah. talk to murph murph if anybody knows it's probably jake that'll know to be honest oh, yeah, he knows fair. all technical things fair. murph might know too he yeah. actually murph knows all console things so console between things, the yeah. two of them i know yeah we have all the knowledge we need like okay. 10 steps that way <laughs> that's cool i remember yeah. when the gold um cartridge cartridge oh yeah like we were just like, what? Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just Before felt expensive. Point, yeah, yeah. Like you, you didn't know that that was an option. Like yeah. It was just, they all have to be colors, gray. Right? They're yeah. not going to be, yeah. What? <laughs> uh, yeah. Our, so I'm having lots of fun playing Zelda games this year uh, because it's the 35th anniversary. Right. Right. As opposed to all the other years you played them because they're it's just Zelda's cool. Yeah. Because I compulsively play one game forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. That's Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Grav Galati, Truck Tie, Jamie Block, Damon Lynch, Shauna Gillis, and Evan Limberger. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the living card animations that begin our show and sometimes sit behind us. Yeah, I think Jeffrey did that one. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at LivingCardsMTG. And Jim, why don't you tell everybody? We've said spike feeders over and over during uh, this episode. Obviously, if you just type the spike feeders into your YouTube search bar, they are going to pop up. But do you have any other ways that people can find you online? Yeah, uh, you can reach me on Twitter. That's my primary social media. Uh, I'm at JimTSF or at the spike feeders if you want to reach the whole group. For whatever reason, there is seven of us. Um, but if you want to reach me in particular, either to talk about CAG things or to talk about uh, you know anything else, if you want to just talk to me one on one, you can message me on Twitter. Uh, or uh, YouTube, Twitch, that's about it. We will have all the links in the show notes and definitely, 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 if there is a rules committee announcement that you do not like, then Jim is the one you should talk to. <laughs> yep, he is in charge of all that stuff and I have nothing to do with it. So thank nothing, you, Jim. Yeah, I hope you get some great <laughs> messages from all that. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>